Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? We are here for a very exciting moment. We are kicking off SmartCon Week. Yeah. How many people are going to SmartCon? Okay, virtually every hand. That is that is awesome. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I know a lot of people have joined us from long, long, well, long, far, far distances. We've heard about flights of 19, 20 plus hours. And so obviously this is a very important week for us. This is something we care a lot about. It's really engaging and being here present with you. Um, and so uh, without too much to do here, I really just want to kick it off and hand it over to Sol. But uh, I want to do a brief introduction to Sol. So Sol joined the Chainlink Labs team about 11 months ago. And even before her first day, she had already started organizing and presenting at conferences all about Chainlink, all about empowering smart contract developers. Yeah. No, so <laughs> Sol is absolutely fantastic. If you've been anywhere in the world in the last 12 months, probably even maybe like 36 months, you might have seen Sol at any sort of crypto conference. She is fantastic. And I know one of her personal passions is really about empowering you, right? Bringing the power of smart contracts and whether that can be transformative to you as a developer out in the world. And she is fantastic at this. So without too much more, I will hand it over to Sol and have a fantastic workshop here, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, thank you, Stephen, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we are here. Please, uh, and we are streaming this live as well. So, the people who is live, please tell us in the chat if it's good for you as well. And uh, I just saw that we have some uh, advocates, some people that is helping us online, and this is amazing. And here, uh, one point that I'd like to tell you, uh, if you you cannot do some exercise, ask help for your friend and try to help if you did yours, try to help who is with you. Let's do this together. Uh, and uh, we are creating as much content together. My first question is, um, who never created as much content before? Yes, I love you. <laughs> Not that I don't like the others, but I really love to do this with the people who is starting now. And uh, who don't have a MetaMask wallet or something like this in your computer? Okay, great. And um, uh, for the people who already has, I will ask you a bit of patience because like I will install my MetaMask and install again with you and do all the process from zero, okay? It's really, really important to go from zero. And in fact, I don't have slides. Like I have uh, two slides probably. One is this. The other is my contacts. And I will show this later for you again. And uh, let's go. This is our collaborative pet. And if you are here with me, or if you are online, we are using the same pet. Let's wait a minute for you. And I need to copy this as well in the chat. Wait a bit more, one minute more to copy. Okay, can I go? So let's go. Um, so I will go out my presentation now. And wait, I need to go to this. Yes. And now I know that you are not seeing my screen anymore. 
So let's change it. I need to change both screens. So I will stop here. And also I need to stop here, not this, not this. Here we are, and share this screen, just I have one now. And, okay. Uh, here we are. We, we are in the same pad. And this is the, the, the schedule today. We have, this is the room one, and the room two as well. And I'd like to ask you to hide this, okay. Where I am? Why is not lost? Why is not? It's supposed to me, I, I will refresh this because I don't know why it's not appearing for me. Hmm. It's not responding. What's happened? Oh. Yes, hi. You could do this. I need to do this as well. Why I can't? My computer is crazy now. I just, uh, I used to say that uh, to do workshops live, it's like to live it dangerously because uh, we never know what will happen. And you can see that my computer is not talking with me now. Uh, I don't know. I you try to put something here because I don't know if. Yes, it's really the keyboard that's not working, and I have no idea what I. Uh, how can I fix this without initiate it? <laughs> yes, this is the problem. And I uh, you go offline or again? Did I do something wrong? I think no. No. Oh, yeah, is it working? Oh, oh, I'm happy now. So I'd like to know how many people do you have here and who is with me? So put your name and your city and country. Name, name, not known. Name, oh, it's better now. No. Name, city, country. So, São Paulo, Brasil, yes. Wow, this is amazing. And you can see now that we are in the same pad. This is a collaborative pad. Um, all of you can write and all of you can erase everything. So be careful, especially when I put some code that uh, you need to copy, you need to copy and not cut the code. And uh, talking about this, uh, an important uh, message that I'd like to tell you, I need to be here or I will be out of the, the screen, uh, is that uh, the only thing that you need to know today to do this workshop is how to copy and paste, is this. <laughs> If you know how to copy and paste, you will copy the code, paste in your uh, browser, and you will deploy the, your first smart content, and you can do everything. And obviously, you will understand what you are doing. But this is the only need, thing that you need to do now. And this is really amazing. We have a lot of people over there. Wow, we have people from Germany, Ethiopia. But I don't know if these people are here or no. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We are together. So is this. Like I said before, we need to have some requirements. And the first requirement is to have a MetaMask installed, to have eaters on Girly. And also, we will use Link not now, but a bit later. So this is. These are the requirements. And I will do something now that you don't need to do, but I will install my MetaMask. 
And I will start again with you to be sure that the beginners can do this as well and understand what's a wallet. So I don't have MetaMask anymore. And let's start it. This is MetaMask. And okay. And I will talk a bit higher now. So I will download this. And I know that there are a few people doing this with me now. I am in Chrome just now and install MetaMask for Chrome. And add to Chrome. And this is a, an extension. It means that um, I have this injected in my browser. And any application that has this, uh, ha, ha, that would like to use my, uh, my extension, my wallet, could use it if I allow to do this. And it's checking, probably you are doing the same. And uh, another point. If uh, I know that most part of the people already has MetaMask installed, but I'd like to tell you that don't use a real account uh, now, okay? You need, to, you need to have an account only for test tokens and another account to your real money. Don't use the same, even if you'd like, okay, I'd like to use the same seed phrase and to use to create a new account. No, never. You need to have different seed phrases for this, okay? And if you'd like to uninstall your MetaMask now and install again, again be, uh, be sure that you have your seed phrase, okay? This is important. And get started. Uh, okay, I'd like to help them. They are my friends. And I will create a new wallet now. Uh, this password is not important because if I forgot it, this is not a problem. What I can't forget no, uh, in any way is my seed phrase, my 12 works. Mm. Okay, I need to agree. Great. And I do not see this video now. And here. Here is the most important part of the wallet. And I will do something now that you never do this, okay? I'm doing this because I am a teacher. I will, I will share with you my seed phrase. And any of you can store my tokens. But I hope that you are good guys and uh, allow me to teach you, okay? So let's do. Uh, this is the most important part of your wallet. And you need to, to save this uh, very carefully, okay? Now I, I need to paste this. And don't do this like I put in, in a notepad. I'm doing this only because I'm a teacher now. So, so I need to check this. Um, this, this. And hope you are doing the same. Modify round, no round. Um, where do we visit random? Where do we visit random? Is this so? This is my wallet. Don't stop my my tokens, please. <laughs> <laughs> and all done. Now I have a new wallet. And for you that's starting with me, this is so important, guys that are installing your MetaMask now we will not be on mainnet. So change this, uh, you need to, to show the test nets. We are using a test net. Go to show height test networks and turn off, turn on show test networks. Is this, you need to enable the test networks and go up, scroll up and close the settings, okay? To do this again, show hide test networks, enable, scroll up, close the settings part. Now you can go to Gurley. This is the Gurley 
network. It is, is one of the test networks that we are using now. Next point, I need to have some eaters on Girly and I will use the chaining faucet. I know that I already put the faucet here for you. And uh, first, I will connect my wallet. The people who are, was installing MetaMask, is it good for you and you? It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Here we are. I connected my wallet, my new wallet, and because I selected Girly before on MetaMask, here I have Girly, and I'd like to have a link and it. But to have the it, I need to connect my Twitter account. If you don't have one, uh, you can put your address later in the pad, and we try to send some for you. And I know that uh, I'm already connected, and I will have a problem now. I will show my problem. This is funny because I had I was connected in another account, and um, probably I need to disconnect and connect again. Let's see. Send the request. It's completed, but I know that is not completed. Okay, so if it is happening with you, you need to disconnect your tweet account and connect again. And now we work, but I need to prove again that I am you one. Okay, let's see, send the request. Now you can see that I have two transactions here, one related to the link tokens and another related to the eaters and they are going to the blockchain when they are inside the block, they are confirmed. So probably it's confirmed, is in pending, indexing. And here we are, I have girly tokens now. And another in, uh, point, I will close this MetaMask and I will use the app now, pin. And now I can use this. So here we are. In the assets part, I know that I receive a link, but where is my link just now? I can't see my link token. So I need to add the link token. How can I do this? Let's go to the next slide. Here is the link token on Girly and also in our networks. And this is so important for you. Uh, when you'd like to, to discover an address of any token, go to the original site and be sure that you are getting the right address on the right search. Like if I am here and I search for Girly, here we are. I can simply add to wallet over there and it will open my MetaMask account or I can copy the address like I you do now and paste on MetaMask. And where I you do this, I you go to the import tokens and be careful can have, can have other tokens on internet that's called link, but it's not the real link. So you need to check in the Chainlink website, okay? Add custom token and I have 20 links. This is great. Yes, I am done to create the smart content now. Next step. To create the smart content, we can do this like uh, with installing something in your computer, but I prefer to do this online using an online environment to develop it. We are using the Remix. And remember that I'm putting all the information for you in the pad and you can copy and paste in your own computer. This is Remix. 
it is better white or black for you is the same it's okay i think it's okay because of the light so this is remix this is a, is a online environment to develop and now we will create your first smart content it will call create register register.so probably i have it let's see to create this you need to go here in this uh, create new file icon okay and then you will create the register let's see if i have it I know that I have it, so I still one. This is my file. Okay. Um, okay, you need to have the register. So I you copy and paste this in our pad. You need you need to copy and paste what is inside this. Don't cut. And I will explain what I have here. Here we are. First line, I have the license. This is a comment, but uh, it's good to have this. Then I have the pragma command. This is used to define which version of Solidity are you using. And now we are defining our content. We use the command concrete to do this. And this, the name of my content is registered, like I said before. What I have in my content? I have first a string. Uh, this is a variable that I can uh, save any information over there. And the name of my variable is info. And this is private. Be careful with this private because it is not so private like you think. Uh, because when you, you send some information, you save some information inside this variable, it's possible to monitor the transaction. We are in the blockchain, this is transparent. So it's possible to see what you are saving on this variable, okay? But uh, think that the private means that it will be used only inside this smart contract. Then I have a function called getInfo. Uh, this is public, anyone can call this function. And this is a view because I'm not changing nothing in the blockchain. I'm only reading some information that it's over there. And it will return the, info the information that I saved in my variable before. Then I have another function called setInfo, and this function can be monitored on blockchain. Like you can see every time that uh, anyone call this function and save information in the blockchain, for example. And here I'm passing some information to save inside my variable. Is this? This is, is our first smart content. Do you have any doubt uh, from this part? Okay, let's go. Next, go to the fourth icon in the left side. This is the Solidity compiler. You can see that you have a green button over there. It means probably you don't have, and you don't have because you need to select the out compile. And after this, uh, or if you didn't this before, you will compile the register.sol. And now you will have the green button over there. And after this, I will go to the next icon. This is the deploy and run transactions. And this is so, so important because Remix has a blockchain simulator in your browser, but I, I I need, I'd like to do this in the testnet, not here. So I need to change the environment. I go to environment and choose the injected provider. And this will be MetaMask. 
So environment injected provider. And remember, if you, you need any help, uh, look at the who is near you or uh, raise your hand. You are here to help you. And I know that we have people online help you as well. When I do this, uh, you can see that my MetaMask, you open a window and I need to allow uh, the Remix website to use my MetaMask account. So this is next and connect. Now I am connected and this is Mao, but you can see here that this is the girly network. And this is my account. So I added this information here only to be sure. Solidity compiler. Uh, out compile, compile, and then deploy and run transactions and environment injected provider. Okay, now we are done to deploy our first smart content. You will scroll down. And you can see the content part. Uh, this can be a list, but we don't. We have only one smart content. So here we have the register content, and you can click on deploy. MetaMask, you open another window, and I need to authorize Remix to send this transaction using MetaMask. I'm sending the transaction to the blockchain now. Confirm. So deploy. If my phone die, he said, do you know? Let's ask in the chat if they can hear me. So you can see here in deployed contracts part uh, that you have your contract over there. And I will ask you to put your name and register address in our pet. Yes. This is mine. Okay. And let's see what happened with my contract. You can first to copy the address of your contract. We have you have a, a button in the right side of the name and you use this button to copy. Okay, use this to copy the address. Remember that you need to scroll down in the deploy and run transactions part, go until deployed contracts, find your contract and click on copy button. And then you will paste in our chat. And let's see what's happened, what I have in my contract. First, if I click on get info, I have nothing. And why I have nothing? Because I didn't save any information in my smart contract now. I will start this just now. So to save information, I use the set info. And I'd like to, to put the smart contract. 2022 is this. Then I will click on setting button. And again, I'm sending another transaction to the blockchain. The first transaction was to deploy this month content. This transaction is to uh, 
add some information over there to save the information. Confirm. We are waiting the transaction be inside the block. Yes, it's done. Let's see. Let's go back to Remix and try to get info again. And yes, I have the smart contact here. Um, now, I remember, we are on blockchain. It means that I can see your smart contract. And I'd like to see another smart contract. Let's see. Um, Bella is here. How are you? Yes. Nice to meet you. I'd like to see your smart contract now. Okay. Even if you don't like it, it's on blockchain and I can do this. So I copy the address of your smart contract. And what I need to do, what I need to have to see any smart contract on the blockchain. I need to have two informations. First, the address of the smart contract. Second, I need to know the uh, what functions my smart contract has. I can do this using an application, the ABI, the application binary interface, or if I have the source code like we do, because we are using the same, I can do this. So I have, uh, we are, you, you have the same source code. If I go here, not deploy, but I go to the at address and paste your address. And then I will click on at address. When I scroll down, I can see that I have another copy of register. And this is not mine. This is Bella copy. And let's see what he adds in his smart content. I hope to be some good. Nothing. Nothing yet. Okay. I add my name is in your smart content. Set it. Let's see. Let's await the confirmation. It's confirmed. You can see that it's confirmed here. Uh, it's not be so bad for you if I put it in this way. It is small or no? It's confirmed. I can see here. No, it's not confirmed. I can. I need to wait here. Yes, now it's confirmed. Bella, could you tell me if your smart contact changed it? Here. Yes, uh, click on the set, the get info button. Um, no. Am I getting it? Yes, probably I understand. Uh, probably this is not the address of your smart contract. Is this the address of your wallet? You need to check this. Maybe it's not your smart contract. Okay, let's see the next. Uh, Rafael is here. Is Raf Are you try your now? Let's see. So I will close this because it's not working and I'd like to use this now. Oh, wow. Rafael added the smart con half, half. Yes. Wow, nice. Can I, I will change this? Okay. Even if you don't like, I can do this. <laughs> and we are we will talk about this. So this is interesting uh, because we are on blockchain, and my first smart contract don't have nothing to control the access. It means that anyone can interact with other smart content. Uh, so try to change the smart content of your friend in your site. You can do this. You can change whatever. And uh, this, is, this is a good example for a smart content to start, but uh, you cannot use this like a real smart content to, to app because you need to have some kind of control access in your smart content. You can see now that we don't have nothing and we, we can uh, change the others. This is not so good 
if we are in the real life. Oh, <laughs> and this is so interesting because I'm sure that I changed to so smart con, but another person changed to anyone, and it was not me. Okay. And it, this is real. We are in the internet, and uh, it can be someone that is here or that it's online. You'll be the same. Yes. So our next step will be create another version of register that we can have some access control. Okay. Do you have any debit now in this first part? And who create your first smart contact now? Just raise your hand for me, please. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, so uh, I'm so glad with you guys. So happy that you could do this. So let's go. You have another smart contact now. And I'd like to know how many we have. Oh, this is good. And our second contract will be the register access. And I'm not sure if I have it here. Let's see. Yes, I have it. So let's create now the register access.sol. And in the same way, I will copy this for you and paste between the beginning and end. And here we are. You can copy and paste this. And what do we have different in the registered access conflict? First, uh, and I will teach you a lot of solid concepts just now. First, now I don't have only one information on my info. I have a list of strings, an array of strings. Second, now I have another kind of variable that the type of address, I can store any address over there. And this is public, anyone can, can see it. And uh, public means that remix you solidity you create like a function with the name of your variable to return this information. And also I have another kind of uh, of solidity type. This is the mapping. The mapping it's a key value uh, type. So for each address I can have a true or false information. And this will be our whitelist. So I will uh, define if uh, some address can uh, do whatever I'd like to do or not. I'm controlling this just now. In the same way, I will introduce you the constructor. The constructor is a function that it will be called only when you deploy your smart content. And it, use, it is used to uh, initiate some uh, information, some values. In this case, I'm using to define that the owner of the smart content is the address who is sending the transaction, message.sender. And I'm adding this address in the whitelist. It means that this address has the true value and can do something that I didn't know what it can do. Not yet. Now I have the event. The event, it's um, a way that uh, Solidit can uh, send some information outside the blockchain. And you can have any, uh, any app, any JavaScript or whatever, any kind of application that a service and can monitor on this information. And for me, I have an event called info change. And this will uh, tell you what is the old information and what is the new information. Now, I'd like to introduce you a new concept. This is the modifier. 
when I create a modifier, I can use this modifier in different functions. And I have two modifiers here. First is the only owner, and it means that only the, the owner that I saved before, I know who is the owner, uh, the owner, uh, the person, the address who is sending the transaction is equal the owner. And I'm using the required to define this, okay? And this here, I forgot the name of this. It's, uh, how is the name of this? Yes, and uh, if you have the underscore after, it means that it will continue the code, wherever it will be, okay? In the same way, I have another modifier that is the only whitelist, and I'm checking if the sender of the transaction has a true value in my whitelist. Now, the get info, because I have a list of information, the get info is used to get the information of one spot, one index, and I need to pass the index and I will retrieve this position only. I have this, remember the set info. Now the set info, you must say the position and then the information you would like to have. And wow, here we are the only white list. It means that now only the address who is in the white list can change my information now. And this this, I may emit uh, an info change and change the info. Important that I cannot start um, to use the set info. First, I need to add the information before. So here we are. To add the information, I'm only sending the information, is the only white list as well. And I will add the information in the end of the list, and I'm returning the, the position of this for you. And only after you add some information, you can change it using the set info. Now I have the list info. This will list all the list. And this is so important because, interesting, in all the versions of Solidity, you don't have uh, the possibility to do this. If you try to return a list array in a function, it's not possible. Like, I don't remember in which version this started, but only in the newer versions you can do this. So this is interesting because if you have smart contracts in different versions, they you work in a different way. And let's talk about the manage part of our application. This is the add member and delete member. And uh, like using this, I will say who can uh, change my list, who can change my information. If I put an uh, address here and say that this is true, he's in the white list. Or if I put that it's false, he's not in the white list anymore. In fact, if you you don't have nothing, like in the beginning, we are not starting out the address that are in the world, the default is false, okay? And you can see that only owner can do this. So this is in this is the way that I use the modifier. I put the modifier in the function, and then after the condition it's true, it will go to inside the function, or if it's false, we will not go this, okay? Do you have any doubt related to our smart contract? Okay. Is it okay for you? So it's time to deploy. I'm going again. You can see the solid compiler because you you enable enable the out compile, so it's compiled. I don't need to do nothing now. I can go directly to deploy and run transactions, scroll down, and go to my register access content. Uh, in the future, you can have more contents here, okay, in the same file. And now I will deploy. Confirm. Oh. 
have a quick question. Yes. How do you, uh, in Remix, it's showing how much gas each uh, function is going. How are, how are you doing that? Um, this is funny because the people are asking this for me like from two weeks ago until now. And in fact, I didn't know what I enable in my remix, but okay. I did something. Uh, yes, uh, probably is in the plugin manager. It's, prob I don't know if this is something that I, I have here, but I don't know yet. I, I discovered and tell you. In active models, I don't know what's active or uh, if it is in the settings. But I know, I did something, but I, I need to discover what. I have a question. What you're showing is, is that um, compatible with any chain that runs so that it fits most contracts? There's nothing here that's changed specifically, correct? No. Exactly, because, uh, for example, I can add another chain, any EVM compatible chain on my MetaMask. If I only uh, select this chain, uh, Remix automatically you deploy in this new chain. Okay. And nothing in the code makes it work on one EVM? No, no. And for the people who is online, uh, the question is, uh, how about to deploy in other EVM chains? Okay. And this is, uh, in fact, you don't, uh, this, if you, you, your smart content is EVM compatible, you can deploy in any chain. You only need to, to set up the chain. Okay. If I want to run an avalanche uh, C chain, for example, it yes. will work without any chain. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Wow, this is amazing. Um, and uh, what I have here, uh, I have some some socks and some um, for cups. And uh, only to be sure that you will be with us until the end of the day. Uh, our last session will be again. And this is for the winners. It's not for now, it's only for the winners. So probably you did this. Yes, I have mine as well. Yes, I have my register access. And uh, you have it. Okay. This is mine. And let's do some tests with this. This is my registered access. And you can see that now I have a lot of uh, orange and blue buttons. And uh, uh, what is the difference? Why some buttons are blue and other are orange? Do you know? You cannot say. Uh, why some buttons are orange and others are blue? The other guy. Um, I believe the orange is actually modifying the contract data, and the blue is just like a turn. Yes, it is. The orange button it's changing the state on the blockchain, and the blue button it's only carrying some information. Uh, I can say that uh, when I send a function that's the orange button, I'm sending a transa transaction and this will be broadcast in the blockchain. And when I'm using a blue button, it will be qu queried only in the node that I am connected. It means like in my in the MetaMask node just now, and I need to trust the MetaMask node to use this. It's something like that. Okay. And let's try this. First of all, I'd like to add information. Smartphone, you can add any information. Remember that you need to add and then you can change after if you like it. And only uh, me now can change my smart content. And I will try another in a few minutes to be sure that this is okay. So let's see, if I go to my listing for now, 
nothing yet. Why nothing? Probably it's not confirmed. Yes, now yes. List info, smart con. Then I'd like to put uh, 2022. Remember, I can have a list of information now. Also, I can see if my address is in the white list. This is my address. And if I go to the white list and put my address, it returns true. So I am in my white list. Con, it's still pending. What more can I see? This is my address. If I go to get info on the index zero, it's the smart con. If I try to go to the get index on index two, it is, didn't exist yet. Probably I will have an error here. And now it's confirmed list info has smart con 2022. But I'd like to change the 2022 to September 2022. But it's not here. I go to set info and this is on the index one. So I will put the index one and the information is September 2022. Transact and confirm. Let's wait a bit more. Do you have any question? Yes, it's confirmed. Let's see now. List info. Here we are. Smart com, September 2022. And I will add this so at the end. And my next step is to try uh, another smart content. You can ask. Do you see the gas only um, on the screen that shows the MetaMask? Can you also <laughs> restrict it in the code itself if they run this transaction only with this gas limit? Um, no. Think that the gas limit is something that you you can restrict on code if you are sending a transaction using like JavaScript, using another way, uh, but uh, not inside a smart content. What you can do uh, when, uh, like if I am on Remix, I can uh, restrict this here. I can change the gas limit here or I can change the gas limit uh, as well when I sending the transaction. Like uh, I used to, not the gas limit. The gas limit is not good to change because when you are sending a transaction using MetaMask, the gas limit is calculated. You can change the gas price. This is good. I'm not uh, uh, thinking about the gas price because I am on testnet. But if I am on mainnet, I used to check this, okay. And uh, let's see, probably I have the last information here. And I'd like to test another smart contract. Smart con September 2022, so. Uh, let's see. Um, who is Jay? Jay, is Jay here? Hi. Uh, are you try your smart content? Oh, you know what? I'm JW. Ah, okay. Uh, it's you? Okay. Let's, uh, are you try your smart content? And I know that I can't do this, okay? Because I'm not in your list. The second is yours, not mine. And if I try to add the information here, 
I can't. Is this? I got an error because I'm not in the white list. And now we have a real contact that uh, we are managing this. Uh, Jay, could you add me in your white list, please? Are you put my account over there? This is my account. And uh, who would like to change my smart contact? What's your name? Christian. Christian, put your name and address here, please. And I'm adding Christian to mine, and Jay is adding me to his smart contact. So I go here and add member. I'm adding Chris. But I'm trying to add Chris in J Smart Content. I cannot do this. <laughs> Let's do on mine. Let me know when I can change yours. Yes? OK. So let's go back to J content again. And now you can see I can change J content now. And talking about guests, uh, like if I came here and edit, I can change the, the fee. Okay. Like you can go to advanced options. The guest limit is calculated. Uh, this is the minimum that I need to send uh, because it's calculated uh, to send this transaction with the, the size of the information that I'd like to send. Don't change this, okay? Not for less. But I will not change nothing now. Confirm. And this will be my last transaction. Then you will see some, some co-presentation related to unstoppable domains. Are they here? Probably they are outside. Ah, it's confirmed. So let's go to J list. Uh, you don't have enough in your list before J. No? No? Because your list was empty. Only have my information now. And let's see if Christian could change mine. I'm add adding another information on J contract. And let's come back to mine and see if Jay changed mine. Did you, uh, Christian, did you try to change mine? Uh, yes, uh, you need to copy the address of my content. So go up, up in the line 236, copy this, then go back to remix, paste here in at the address, and click on at the address. It will open another instance of this content with this address. Could you check if you stop the domain right now? Okay. Yes, I know. Yes. One minute. Did you change something? Okay, let's see. Is it confirmed? Not yet. 
painting, okay? Chadang. This is our last transaction. Not yet. And now? Is it confirmed? Quick question while that is pending. Um, what is an event? Um, an event, it's, uh, you can see the event outside. It's like a log for blockchain. Uh, and you can uh, monitor this kind of, this is not inside the block exactly, and you can monitor this uh, using some service outside. Okay. Thank you. If you weren't here, what would I Google besides what is an event to find that answer? How to find the event just now? Yeah, like, how would I like, or is there like a resource that I could just Google to find what an event is? Uh, Yes. It's solidity, solidity events. Yes. Yes. Uh, where is the other mic? Uh, if you go to uh, YouTube, uh, do events and logging in Hard Hat of Brownie, uh, there's a couple of videos that we've made on it. So. You will find Patrick video. Yes. <laughs> Not yet. So. Uh, you see that, uh, you saw that I changed Jay's contract, so this is enough for now, uh, because I, I'm out of time. And uh, it's just, guys, thank you so much for creating our first smart contract. Yes. Now, um, you, you will learn a bit about unstoppable domains, and then I will back later this to teach you how to create a token and use chain link that fits with your token, okay? Uh, what is the other mic? Do you know? The other. This, this, because I have this. <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, are you?
openings and the EOI life around the world now. Cool. And no it, pressure. <laughs> good luck to tell us more about the stuff of the links. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, Took me a couple minutes there to get my computer set up, but uh, we are hooked in now and ready to go. I'm going to give you kind of the abridged version. I know that we're, I'm already over the time that I was allotted. Uh, so, yeah. Um, again, my name is Alexander. I'm a software developer at Unstoppable Domains. Uh, I've been there about six months. Um, I work on the login and identity team. Um, and it's just an amazing journey getting a chance to work with Web3 technology directly and um, just be developing on the forefront of what the future is going to look like for identity in general. Um, so I'm really excited to share these slides with you. I'm not going to talk through every slide. I know you can all read. Um, so I'm just going to move through this. Uh, if I've got any time to answer some questions, uh, you, can, you can always stick around over in the corner. You can come you know, grab me if you'd like. All right. So um, first things first, uh, if you want to get started integrating our login product into your dApps, uh, you can use these QR codes. We've got an onboarding guide. We've got the technical documentation online. Um, and our off library there is it's available on GitHub to peruse. So if you guys want to take pictures of these really quickly, Feel free to do so. And I can always return this slide at the end if, if you guys don't want to catch up, but I'm going to maybe move on to this next slide. All right. Um, yeah, we, we believe people should benefit from the value they create online. Uh, what that means is we believe in giving a person's data back to them, which is a, a big deal for us. Right now, data is very centralized on the web and web too. Um, and we are moving forward with our product with the intention of allowing you to have control over your data and have control over the data that applications that you log into have access to. So that's a big deal for us. Um, a lot of use cases right now for the login with Unstoppable product. Um, simplifying crypto payments is a big one. Uh, instead of having a difficult to remember wallet address, you have a NFT domain that you can share with your friends and family for the purpose of transacting money or, or NFT exchanges or token exchanges or whatever. Um, the Login with Unstoppable, that's a team that I work on. Um, you can log into different dApps and websites with your Unstoppable domain. And again, using the uh, UD profile page on our website, after you purchase one of the domains or after you get one of the free ones, um, you, you have a lot of control in, in terms of what uh, what data these dApps will have when you log into them. And, and that's kind of that step about giving you control over your data. Um, yeah, I kind of touched on this. Yeah, so benefits to using uh, Longer than Unstoppable. It's, it's easy authentication. Uh, it allows you to quickly, quickly authenticate using your, your domain. Um, data permissions are, are right there when you go to log in. Request permissions to access personal data if you want, uh, like the user's email addresses. We've got a number of scopes that are listed on the, uh, in the technical documentation. Um, it is really easy to integrate the Login with Unstoppable product. I did it. I bought a domain on Web2, and I spun this up using our uh, Login pop-up, um, got it deployed through Netlify, and I think the whole process took me like 30 minutes. It was really, really fast. I think the hardest part I had was getting all the domain stuff set up through Netlify after I purchased it on Google Domains, but it was, it's a really, really simple process. The documentation is outstanding. Um, really, really easy to integrate. Um, we've introduced Humanity Check as an option uh, through the login process, and we're partnering currently with a company called Persona. Um, it allows you to verify the user is who they say they are, preventing things like, um, you know, uh, robots or scripts or something doing the automated uh, sign-ins or, or identity theft, things like that. There's a little how it works section here. Um, I'll probably ask the other speaker for an email address that I can send this slide show to. That way you guys all have it if you want to. I know I'm kind of moving fast. Um, yeah, so it's the user flow for, you know, getting verified humanity check. Once you're verified, uh, you get a little check mark there. In the process of going through the humanity check, again, this is 100% opt-in. It's not required. Um, Upload a photo ID, take a picture of yourself. I've done this a couple of times for, for different uh, companies. Then scopes for login right now, supported scopes are open ID, um, wallet, uh, email optional, humanity check optional, your profile, your social optional. And we're working on adding uh, additional scopes all the time. So if you're interested in your product, make sure you stick, uh, you know, keep an eye on the technical documentation online because it is updated really frequently. Um, let me skip these parts here. This is the log and stoppable user flow. Um, this explains the process by which a user logs in using our product um, from a technical, technical standpoint. This same diagram is available on our documentation online. So um, again, just really, really good documentation. Uh, Logging is always going to be free. Um, 
This is like, you know, how's it different from logging on the wallet? Um, it's associated with your NFT domain. Uh, it allows you to maintain control over um, what kind of data the user shares with you. They're allowed to opt in. You're allowed to set the scopes for it. And then, yeah, humanity check, uh, personal data through humanity check. Um, it, none of that data comes back to the app that is integrated, logged, and unstoppable. Uh, Persona, as the, as the company we partnered with to uh, perform the humanity check process, they, uh, they persist their data for the purposes of their own legal requirements. In terms of what data is communicated back to us, it's really just a true or false. It's like either you are a person or not, and they give us a random ID that gets generated at that point. Um, so we don't have access to any of the data that Persona gets through the humanity check process. I highly recommend you join our Discord. Um, it's super active, it's got a great community. Uh, it's one of the best places to get help on an issue you have maybe integrating or a question you have about anything long and most topical related. Um, so yeah, this is the Discord QR, uh, QR code there if you guys wanna take that. Um, and then I'm gonna point back to the technical documentation in here. And that is my slideshow. That was the speed run. The speed, that is speed run of my slideshow because I'm already five minutes over. over here. Uh, yes, uh, question, question for you. Sure. So, if you're integrating um, unstoppable domains with the humanity piece, mm -hmm. um, do you have to present your, you know, documents of incorporation to get access to the humanity check? No. Or me as the no. provider, I just sign up with my. My. Domain. So, if are you, do you mean if you're integrating it into your app, or if you're a person who's trying to log into an app that requires humanity check? I'm integrating my understanding is that there's no additional step it's baked in if you decide you want to use it but um it might be it might be worth asking i can double check and then i'll okay back to on that one i don't, I don't need the wrong answer and anybody else i have wowed you with my ability to talk over some lines <laughs> cool hey what's the possibility to make sure that you haven't been uh identity that uh meaning somebody presenting documentation Mm -hmm. uh, that supposedly it's, it's them, but it's really you. Like, how do you claim that hey, somebody else is using my uh, photo ID? Oh, through them? Persona? Yeah. Um, they, if you have to provide your photo ID. It's interesting to get more questions about the community check. Um, you have to present your ID. You also have to take a picture of yourself. You have to do it from multiple angles. And so they're, they're going to compare that against the, uh, the identification. It's going to be on Persona, yeah. Um, but their their process it's it's human verified, so it's part it's partially AI, but they do have human verification as well to make sure that, that you are who you say you are when that person goes to take that picture. You got any more questions? Yeah. Uh, so when I sign up for Unstoppable Domain, I want to leverage Humanity Check. Mm -hmm. Is there a fee to leverage that site? No. No fees. Yeah, the login the login product is is uh, it's free to use and free to integrate. And I think I'm getting the is this my gong? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll stick around for a couple minutes. I'm going to let anybody have any additional questions. Uh, but I, again, thank you for your patience. I know it took me a few minutes to, to get on here and get uh, get sharing. But thank you very much.
All right, you're on screen. And I know that I need to stop my tab here. Okay. So let's go. Come on, everyone. Let's talk about the chain link data feeds. Yahoo! Yes. Well, I'm pretty sure that my slide is not updated, but uh, we are talking about to power and DeFi uh, a lot of decentralized Oracle networks. And uh, what is this? What I'm talking about with you? Uh, this is related to get data and asset prices in your smart contracts from external sources. And uh, I'm talking about the full market coverage about decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges. And uh, we have some premium data providers, aggregators and exchanges. Uh, it's interesting to understand how it works. It's uh, the volume-based average method. And this is available on many blockchains. We were talking about to deploy in different blockchains. So this is so easy. In, in a few minutes, I will go to this link, data.chain.link, to show you some real information over there. And in fact, uh, I don't have so many slides because we will do a practical part. Uh, the idea today is to create a token, then to create a minter to your token that any, any person can mint this token. And after this, I will create uh, like a price for this token, but my token, you have a price in USD. And my final goal is to send some eaters to this contract and receive my token. We are doing all of this just now. So this is the, the research, the, the references for you. And if you need a hand, just raise your hand, I'll come around. Yes, we have. Uh, in fact, it's a good time to present the other developers advocates that are here. So probably you know Patrick Collins. Yes. Uh, come, come on, come on, uh, Patrick. Uh, Patrick. 
come over here to the people on, on, on the screen to see you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> in the same way, Patrick, you teach uh, in the afternoon, okay? Uh, I have uh, Zubin, come on, please. Come on, come on. This is Zubin, this is another developer advocate as well. <laughs> and Richard. <laughs> uh, but Richard, the people would like to see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. And I know that I have some advocates here. Who is advocate from Chainlink here? Do you have some some here? There. Okay. Probably they are uh, walking around in New York. I know. Okay. But they are in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, this is the basic demonstration related to the chain link price feeds. The documentation is amazing to you start. I uh, will start with a complex smart contract, but be sure that you can come back here and do this uh, in a calm place later, okay? Let's go. So probably I need to hide to don't share the screen and change the screens again. Let's see. Yes, you are not seeing nothing. I need to stop to share again the order and to change. We was on Remix. Let's see if I have the token here. Yes, I have a token here. And I used this token on Ethereum Sao Paulo like two weeks ago. And OK, you are not seeing my screen, only online. Let's change this here again. OK, great. So let's create a token just now. How is my token? I need to go down and create the token dot sol. In the same way. You are copying and paste from here. And I will copy from here. But let's change my contract first. This will be the smart con workshop. Uh, I'd like to put this in the beginning. Chainlink smart con workshop token. And is this. this is our token. You can see that I'm creating a token with only two decimal places. This is not the default from uh, from ethers. And I'd like to do it this way because it's a great way to learn about this as well. I will copy my token and paste for you. Now you can copy and paste too. And I explain what I have here. And I really like this token. Uh, I like this content. And do you know why? I'm creating a token with only 10 lines of code. And this is amazing. This is magical. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And to understand what I'm doing, I'm importing a Open Zeppelin uh, smart content. And the Open Zeppelin is doing everything for me. And you can see here that I'm using an old version of Solidity. In fact, this version is not good for security. Okay. Uh, don't put this token in real life, please. Okay. But this version has the ERC20 mintable, and uh, I'd like to use this. Uh, what I'm defining here, you know that I define the name, the symbol, and the decimals. You can create your token different from mine. So uh, put a different name, put a different symbol, create your token. Would it affect any condition if somebody has created? No. This is an excellent question. Uh, can I have two tokens with the same name? Yes, I can. I can have many tokens. Like I was telling for you before, uh, be careful to not get a fake link token, for example. Anyone can create a link token, but this is not real. How can I know 
who is the right token going to the right app so going to the search go into chain link and be sure that you got the height the right address and be careful to not be scammed by someone who uh, it's telling you that this is the token but it's not so okay. the app is really the namespace for one or more tokens created in the context uh, of the app and when I'm telling about go to the app, go to the site of that protocol, any protocol, but go to the, the original site of the protocol, get the address. You can go to Etherscan and verify itself, but uh, you need to, to discover this with the protocol, with who, is, who is the owner, who created the token. This is the best way. So here we are, we have a token. We can go di directly to deploy. And I ask you to put your name and token address here. And I will deploy mine just now. Wait to be confirmed, and in a few minutes, I will have a new contact here. Let's close the address. Hey, now I have a token. Is this? Um, I will put the address here for you. And what I have in my token? Uh, I'd like to add my token on MetaMask to see the balance of my token. How I do this? I will go to MetaMask, Assets. Remember that I have the link that we already did this before. Go to Import Tokens, paste the address of your token, and you can see that this is my CSW token with two decimal places and add custom token. I don't have any token yet. This is not a problem. Import token. And I can mint tokens for me just now. So I will copy the, my address. This is my address, the address of my account. Uh, I come back here to the mint part, paste the address, and I would like to have 100 tokens. But remember that I have two more decimal places, so I need to add two zeros and project. Okay, let's wait a minute and I will have 100 tokens. Do you not put a period to say 100.00? No, we cannot use the period. Uh, we cannot, the solidity, um, do not, um, until now, it's not possible to handle with this. So we need to know how many decimal places we have, but we cannot put this inside the number. Because of this, I have a variable over there that's saying that I have two decimals. And if you have another app, you need to, to take care of this all time. So this is related to the number of decimals. And probably, yes, let's see if I have tokens just now. It's done. And yes, I have 100 tokens. Wow. Do you think that you can get my tokens now? No. Because in the way that this token was created, uh, it has a owner. In fact, it has, it has a minter hole. I can have more than one address being a minter in my token. And uh, one point that I'd like to show you. Remember that uh, I create a token with 10 lines of code. 
how it's possible that my token has so many functions? I didn't this. So what is this? This came from the uh, library from OpenZeppery. If I go exactly here, let's see what's happened here. This is the search code that I'm using. And this is our old version. You can see here that I'm importing the ERC token, the mintable role, and this is. All of this is inside my content because I imported it. And here you can see that I can add another address to be a minter and do a lot of things. Okay. I'd like to see my balance now. This is my account. No, this is not my account anymore. Okay. Copy and paste. Here, I, I can see here that I have 100 zero, zero tokens as well. So great. Uh, to be sure that I cannot mint a token uh, that's not mine, let's try another. Uh, where is Austin? I will try to use your token, OK? I have the token selected here at the address. And I'd like to mint tokens. My address. Let's go to mint, put my account, put the zeros, transact. No, I can't. And you can see here, minter hole color doesn't, do not have the minter hole. So I can't mint. But uh, my, uh, what I'd like to do now, I will create another smart content. And this another smart content, after I create it, I will add this smart content in the minter hole, and anyone could mint tokens. And I'd like to show you two points. First, I will create another smart content that you interact with this smart content. And the new smart content can mint, anyone can use and mint tokens. Let's share tokens around the world. How can I do this? First, let's see if I have this here. Yes, I have the token minted here. I will share with you. Create the token minted. And I will show you some different concepts just now. I'd like to talk with you about the interface. What's the interface? The interface defines some function, but we don't have the source code of the function. You can see here that I have an interface called ERC20 minter, and I only have the mint mint function over there. And the mint must have the address, the amount, and it will return true or false. Then I'm creating another smart content, the token minter. <clears throat> that, uh, and inside it is, I will use the interface, and I'm calling my interface token. In the constructor, I will pass the address of the token to use in this interface. Remember that my token has a lot of functions, but I only need to use now the mint. So my interface only has the mint. I only need this. And here we are. I have another function mint here on this smart content that's public. Anyone can call this mint function. And this mint function, it's using the token mint. And this is. Let's do it. Let's deploy. Mm, deploy. And be careful here, because I have more than one uh, definition in my smart content. I have the minter and I have the token minter. So I need to choose the token minter here, OK? Remember this. Is this. Let's deploy it. 
oh, what I need to put on deploy? I need to add the address of my token here. Let's get the address. This is my token. So I'm passing a parameter during the deploy to use on deploy. <clears throat> Wait the confirmation. Wait a bit more. Done. So is this now I have a contract that can mint tokens. Let's do you know that it work now? What do you think about it? Let's see. Are you get my address? And I you put the address, I'd like to mint to 100 more tokens. Transact. No, it's not working. And why is not working? Because I need to add this minter, uh, my minter token contract in the role of the token. It's not yet. So the token didn't allow this contract to mint tokens. Let's fix this. So I you get the address of my token minter. Then I will go to the token and add minter. Add this address over there. Remember that you need to do this. And uh, put here your name and token minter address. Because after this, you can use mint tokens for other people. First, that add mint. <laughs> Confirm. And this is my... I can put this here as well. And it's confirmed, let's see. Yes, now my token minter is in the minter hole and I can mint tokens. I come back to the token mint, transact. Yes, it's working. If you wanted to implement an allow list to only allow certain minters to do the minting, would you add that in the mint function? Yes, in the same way that I create in the register access, for example, I can create here uh, like a mapping address uh, through our files and uh, use this here and not allow everyone. I can allow only some people to do this to do this but maybe does it make sense to do this inside the minter contract i can do this directly on the token i can add the other address directly on the minter hole on token i mean doing this way only because i'd like to everyone can mint tokens this is my goal so i don't have restrictions just now let's distribute testnet tokens to everyone Let's see. Uh, would you like to mint tokens? Any of you, you can try to mint my token. And remember that I was talking with, I forgot his name. Jay. Jay. Uh, no, it's not Jay. I was talking with, um, who is the guy over there? That uh, Austin, okay, Austin. Uh, can I mint your token now? Did you did you uh, did the minter minter? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> exactly. So, uh, I you try to use 
token enter from Austin now and try to get some tokens, not my token now, but his token. Let's see. Token minter, uh, this is mine. Okay. I'd like to try his. Uh, did you put your token minter here? Yes. Okay. Remix token minter at address. The second token minter is not mine, it's Aus from Austin. And let's add my address here. My account, and I'd like to have 1,000 tokens. I hope this token is good, then. Transact. And confirm. Yes, I can do this. So I'm meeting, uh, meeting the Austin token, not mine. And let's see the, uh, I don't know uh, what is this token. Let's see. Token, I got the address. I got the address. Go to my MetaMask and add his token as well. Assets, import. And yes, it's the same name, okay? And this is so interesting because... Uh, I know my is CS a workshop and Austin is CT workshop. Okay. Uh, and I have 1,000 tokens. So I can mint his token. I can mint any token now that if you, you did this process. This is interesting. Uh, now, what about to, to define some price? to mint tokens. We know that we can mint for free, but let's do another exercise and send eaters to a contract and receive tokens. This is the next goal. Uh, is it good until now? Do you have in dubbed? Okay. So I go to the next. I'm prepared to do now the token. I think it's token shop, the name. Let's see. Token shop. Now we are creating the token shop. In the same way, this is the token shop. Let's see what if I need to change something here. No, this is good. And uh, I will use the data feed from Chainlink inside the token shop. Let's understand what's happened here. You can see here that I'm importing another another interface. You know now what's the interface. And this interface is from Chainlink. I'm using the aggregator V3 interface. And uh, think that each pair, each code, like Ether, USD, or uh, BTC, USD, each of these pairs has one address. Each of these is a uh, smart content itself. And using this interface, I can access any of them. In fact, in my case, I'd like to access the ETH USD code on Gurley, and this is the address that I need to use. Remember that to come uh, to the beginning. Now I have another interface here, is the token mint interface. In fact, it's uh, the same of the other interface, okay? I only have the function mint. This is my token shop. Remember that I'm using the price feed. This is the name that I put to get the information, the code. Uh, I have the minter and I'm defining the price over there. And for me, the price like one token, it's $20 with two decimal places. I'm not sure if uh, in some moment during my contract, I have some, uh, I have a zero missing, okay? Maybe it's not exactly this, but something like that. 
And okay, I have a owner here. In the constructor, I'm passing not the token address, but I'm passing the token minter address and define the aggregator, the price feed that I'd like to use and the owner. Uh, in order to get the price, I have this function. This came from the documentation from Chainlink, get latest price. And I only would like to get the price, only this. When I have the price, I'd like to calculate how, how many tokens can I get if I send ethers to my smart contract. So this is the token amount. Are you... Uh, pass the amount of eaters I'd like to send, then this will be calculated using the price of eater, the amount of USD that I can have converting from eater to USD, and calculate how many tokens can I get. And this is the last function. You can see that uh, I have a uh, receive function. This is different. This is a default from Solidity and the receive function in this case is payable. This is the only function that will accept receive eaters in this smart content. If I don't have this and I try to send eaters, I can't. Not in this version of Solidity. In other versions, you can, but this is a mess. We have a lot of eaters lost inside contents, okay? And is this. Um, what I'm doing this way, uh, in fact, I will not call this receive function. I will only send eaters directly to my smart content. And uh, it works. It's amazing. <laughs> what I'm doing here, I'm calling the, the token amount to calculate and then mint tokens. It's only this. So what do you prepare to do this? First, I need to get my token minter address. Then you must be sure that you are in the token shop smart content. Paste the address of the token minter, not the token, must be the token minter, and apply. Okay, let's wait a minute. Almost done. Yes, now it's done. It's this. Now I have the token shop. Let's go down. And you can see that I have the token shop here. Uh, I'd like to know what's the price just now. Let's see. This is the price of Ether in this moment. And we have some zeros here. Let's see how many. It's this. We have eight decimal places. This is the it USD now. And uh, please put your token uh, shop for me. I'd like to buy tokens as well. Uh, so put your name and token shop. I you choose someone to buy tokens? What's mine? This is mine. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I will buy tokens just now. Uh, how can I do this? This is my token. Okay. I'm going directly to MetaMask. And I will send ethers to my contract directly. Send. I paste the address of my contract. And I know that I have is less than 0 0.1. Let's send 0 0.01 girly meters to my content. But how can I calculate uh, how many tokens can I get? I'd like to do this first. Wait a minute. I will come back here. 
and uh, I'd like to calculate the token amount. So I use send eaters, but here I need to use the 18 decimal places. Uh, I don't like to, to do this. Uh, iter, iter converter, I think. Converter. Yes, something like that. Let's see. Uh, I, I think it's not this. Not a internet converted. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, yes, I like this. Let's share this with you first. Here we are. Um, so remember that I'm sending 0 0.01 and this is in way. Way is the, the minimum of Ethereum. Let's put this inside my remix, and I I will send it this, and I will receive six eight tokens. But remember that I have uh, two decimal places, so it means that I will receive zero point six eight tokens. It will be this, okay? Let's see. Now I will send data. Send address again, 0 0.01. Next. Confirm. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, thank you. Oh, it's take. Oh, yes, it's confirmed. Let's go to the assets. And here we are. I have 200.68 tokens just now. I buy tokens, I buy my own tokens. Wow. Amazing, amazing. Uh, I'd like to buy another token. Um, let where is Christian? Now I buy your token. Let's see if it's working. First, I add your token in my MetaMask account. Um, but remember, this is not your token. This is your token uh, shop. So I need to add this not in my MetaMask account. I need to add this here first. Get an instance of your contract. Then I can get the token. I don't have the token here. I can't believe this. I need to put another. Uh, I have the minter. And then if I go to the minter, I get your token. OK. I need to put the token directly here. I will do this in the future. Uh, so let's go to not this, not this, not this. Token minter. I select the token minter. To use that token minter account in Christian address, and he did this in a different version. Yes, or I did, I don't know. So this is the token minter. It's not mine, it's from Christian. And this is the token. So now, now I get the token. I first you get, uh, I will add the token on my MetaMask account, assets, import. This is the first token, is this? OK. And I don't have any token just now. OK. No tokens. Let's get some tokens. Uh, now I need to come back here to not the token minter, but to the token shop, to Christian token shop, and send some link, some eaters to this token. Did you change something, or uh, probably you get the same amount? Is this? Same, same amount. OK. Confirm. Wait, 
wait a bit. Oh, I'd like to know, um, I can discover how many tokens, if it will be the same. Let's see. <laughs> yes, the price is probably the same. Um, because we are in testnet, uh, the price don't change so often like mainnet, okay? Can pass five minutes and the price will be the same. But I think it's done. Let's see. Assets? No, it's still pending. Oh. Okay, let's get more information here. I have the price, I have the mint. Uh, I can check if the amount is good, if it's the same. Oh, it's different. Uh, probably this is an uh, entire eater. Okay, it's, it's weight as well. So this is the token price. Let's see if it's working now. Yes. I'd like to see my balance. Yes, 0.68 fair. So I bought your token. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, another point that I told you, but I didn't share with you. Uh, I talk about this. I'd like to, to show this a little bit. Here we are. You can get the data feeds not only related to prices, but there are other information as well. But you can uh, see, like, let's see the popular, and you can see in different networks, Ethereum, Avalanche, Polygon, uh, BNB. Uh, you have more here, Optimus, like, this is the the ether in different ether in in Ethereum in Polygon, uh, and uh, you can see a lot of tokens here. Be fun over there. In the same way, remember that I share with you the some resources, and this is the basic example. Okay, if you'd like to to test this in in a simple context. This is only getting, it's only using the get latest price. So I use this inside my content. Okay. And this, this, do you have any question? Can you go over again how the uh, token price is determined? Or is it hard coded? I had it coded, yes. Uh, if you go to, let's go to the right place. Inside the token shop, uh, I had it coded in the beginning here. Yes, you can have a different rule, but in my case, I'd like to have the coded in dollars and the same eaters to discover this. More questions? Hi, so we can go lunch a bit early and I'm hungry. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> and you are back at uh, 1, 1 p.m. with NFTs and keepers with his shirt. Yes. Mm, I think we need to, to maintain. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, are you?
So fun fact, I taught fifth grade for a year. So uh, we can do all sorts of stuff like that, yeah. The drama teacher, this wasn't Quiet Cody, this was the drama llama. So fun stuff. I guess people will filter in. Hopefully they can catch up. Uh, or coding. I think it'll be good. Am I? I'm echoing over there, I think. Okay. Can you, I think if you just mute. Yeah, the live stream just got a close up, I think. Okay, so I'm Richard Gottlieber, one of the developer advocates at Chainlink Labs. Uh, we are going to build an NFT together. If you want to follow along, I think it'll be fun. Uh, if you have the same skill set that you had in the previous workshops with Soul, where you can copy paste, then you too are engineers in the software development industry. Um, so let's talk about NFTs. Soul Talk, you built a token, right? And tokens are different than NFTs in that NFTs are a token, but the NF stands for non-fungible. It's a fancy way of saying that you can't just swap them about. I like to think about tokens as like dollar bills, right? If I say, hey, give me a $5 bill. Do I care what the serial number is on that $5 bill? No, I don't. Um, if I say, hey, I just bought a painting from you. Do I care what painting that is? Yeah, right? Like, you know, I, I like to think if I bought a Picasso and I come home and it's suddenly your five-year-old's drawing, I'm going to be kind of upset, right? Like, I care which one it is. So NFTs are a representation of a thing like that. They're non-fungible. You can't swap them out. Uh, common things are like CryptoPunks. You can think about them as tickets. Uh, real estate is a non-fungible item, right? If you go to your house, you care that it's your house, not someone else's house, right? Anytime you think your and it becomes important, probably non-fungible. So when I think about NFTs and I think about my past, I think about my first NFT, Pokemon trading cards. Anybody? Pokemon? Yeah. So trading cards are unique, right? Even though a lot of people may have a surfing Pikachu, each card is unique, right? It's going to be a different amount of wear and tear on it, stuff like that. So those are kind of a good physical representation of what an NFT could be. And they have different varying rarities when we talk about things like this. If you think about a lot of common NFT projects, there's different rarity traits and stuff like that, right? And they're static because you don't want them to change. We talked about the Picasso painting and we don't want our painting to change, right? But personally, I think that type of NFT, boring. Um, I think NFTs can do a lot more. And a common way to think about them is a fantastic use case. Again, if you have a piece of artwork and you want to have ownership of that artwork, you don't want it changing. You want it to be boring, right? Like you want it to be the thing it represents and never change. But I think there's a lot more they can do. And we'll take a look at that today when we build out our project. Because we're going to make a dynamic NFT, an NFT that we can change. So we have on the left here a CryptoPunk. It's static. Doesn't change. Cool project. Great use of a token that you want to have ownership of. On the right, there's this project called Lamella Ball, where of the player change throughout the season. This is an actual project. And I think that is really interesting to have that kind of project where things change over time, right? What are some other things that we could do? So you could have like scores like that example. You could have experiences where as you go and do things, an NFT changes. Imagine if you were a large corporation run by a mouse and you had people collect experiences, right? And you could see like their character changed over time. Uh, this is another project here where the Chainlink logo changed in the NFT itself, like the artwork changed based on the work. So you're incorporating real world events into the blockchain. And that is really what I think is very powerful. And one of the things like I really like about Chainlink. So we have Chainlink solved this problem of bringing off-chain data on-chain. Um, I like to think about, not to throw too many Disney references out there, but I like to think about the blockchain as Genie from Aladdin. 
you know, phenomenal cosmic power, itty bitty living space, right? Like you, you have to live on the blockchain. If it's not on the blockchain, it doesn't exist until you have oracles come along. Those allow you to bring that off-chain data on-chain. So there's three different things I'm going to talk about today. Are to Chainlink, and we're going to use one of them. So having an NFT that can react to the real world. Used them earlier, data feeds, right? Using that pricing information uh, with price feed data. Data feeds can also be used for other information, like that weather, for example. So that's going to be like probably the easiest of them based on the name. You're feeding in data into the blockchain. Uh, the next is VRF, stands for Verifiable Randomness Function. We think VRF just numbers, right? That's having a provably is very important. I think Patrick might have more to say about that after me, um, but we will we will talk about not randomness in our demo here in just a moment. And then finally, we have Chainlink Keepers, uh, which is a way to automate your smart contract. I don't know about y'all. See, and so if I can get a computer to do work for me, I'm all about that. So we'll be using this one in our demo. So I've like blazed through my slides. I'm not quite as fast as the guy from Unstoppable Mains, but <laughs> any questions so far? Yeah. For automation, we'll take a look at that in the demo. I don't want to spoil. Any other ones? Yes. Yes, so there's two ways, and we will see them both address that question as well. The question was, what does event-driven mean? We add that to our demo as well. Good question, though. All right, so don't worry about scanning this. You can type it in on your computers here in just a second. I'll give you the link. But we're going to make a dynamic NFT. We're going to automate it with keepers, and then we'll talk about what else we could do. So we're going to be building... This little dude on left. And if you want to go to this link, there will be two files there. The contract. The second one is the finished one. If you want to work on your carpal tunnel, you can type along or you can just copy and paste the finished one. Watch as we talk about the contract. Everybody good? Still typing? Okay. We good? Okay. So what are we going to build? It looks something like this. So this is on OpenSea. You can see it here. We have our awesome logo, our little dude on that image won't change. What will change are the stats of our player, right? So we have age, happiness, speed, and wealth. All of those things we can change. And we'll take a look at how to do that. But before we dive into that, there are a bunch of different ways to store information for an NFT. This image itself is stored on something called IPFS. It's the interplanetary file system. It's a distributed file. Okay, so it is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer way of storing information. What's really cool about it is it creates a hash when you upload something so that you know when you go to that URL on IPFS, it's always going to be the same thing, right? If we just pointed the image for this NFT to richardsawesomewebserver.com slash picture, you know, I could have this, and the next thing you know, you're going to load your NFT up, and it's going to be a picture of my face, and it'll be really sad. So having a static source like IPFS is a great way to do this, especially since it keeps that distributed nature of things. Um, if you go to IPFS.tech, you can learn how to, like, run your own IPFS node and all of that stuff. There are also services like Pinata, where you can just upload stuff, and it will put on IPFS for you and take care of all of that. All of this is kind of... There's this kind of outside the scope of what we're going to be doing here today, but we'll be using the images from IPFS. So I just wanted to talk about that, let you all know what was going on. Uh, 
uh, not in this demo, no. But yes, like you would, yes, you'd need to do that if you wanted to ensure it was there. Okay, so let's jump into the actual code. We'll use Remix to deploy it. I'm gonna use just a code editor to walk through this. Is that, everybody read that okay in the back? Yeah, good, okay, cool. So we've got kind of a few different steps here that we'll walk through. This should be, if you follow that link, the starter contract. So we should all be on the same page there. We've got our imports. That's where we're pulling in those other contracts, right? Like when we did the token, we imported the contract to give us the ability to have the mintable token. So these are importing a bunch of different things from Open Zeppelin. Uh, the ERC721 is the standard for NFTs. So that's gonna give us all the NFT stuff. Uh, the URI storage is gonna be where the metadata for the NFT is stored. So it's gonna be things like the image, the description, the name, uh, those different stats that we had about like age, speed, wealth, all of that. Uh, the ownable contract, make sure that only the owner can do things, right? You can say it's only owner can do this and you can define the owner. Uh, we have a counter contract. This is gonna let us just increment a counter as we mint one NFT, we'll start at zero. The next one's one, two, three. Uh, these two here are some utilities to one, convert strings into strings. What that means is like when you think about a uh, carry like a line of text, right? Like a sentence, strings, converting some numbers, integers into strings. And then base64 is used to actually encode stuff in base64 encoding, encoding the data within our NFT into base64 that we can pass that to like open C and stuff like that. So we import a bunch of stuff. We set up our contract, we have its name and this is where we're declaring the different types that it is. So it's, it is an ERC 721. It's pulling in those imports that we had before, above, right? The URI storage and ownable as well. We let know that we'll be using counters. We set up our counter token ID. We'll be using strings for uint 256. What this means is that we can convert a unsigned integer into a string. Because when we have the stats of our NFT, we need to save everything in that stat block as a string essentially, right? So when it says that we have a wealth of 51, that 51 starts off as a number, an integer, and we turn it into a string. While the way it looks to us, doesn't change. Solidity really cares about that. All right, so that's like the setup, the boring stuff. Then we have this array of characters, and this is going to be that IPFS data where we're talking about the actual images, right? So we have our little elf guy, we have a knight, an ogre maybe, yeah, there he is, a little ogre and a witch. So these are the possible different images that we could have for our character. All right, we create a struct. Um, if you're familiar with other programming languages, I think of this like an object where we're going to say a player has a image, age, happiness, speed, and wealth. So these are all the different attributes that make up what the player is. We then create a array of players. So those little square brackets, that's an array. It means like a list of those. And we call it players. And then we create a mapping, which I believe we did earlier today, right? Mapping? No? Yeah? Okay. Blank stairs make me scared, y'all. So we create a mapping from the token ID to the player. So when we mint the NFT, this will keep track of that player data that we we're describing up above. Uh, our constructor, which is used when we deploy the contract, does nothing except for define the name and the token ID for this NFT token that we're deploying. So this is where we're starting out. We have a couple other things here, uh, burn and token URI. These come from Open Zeppelin. And I guess real quick, I'll show you too. If you go to Open Zeppelin and check out their oof, internet speed contracts docs woof this is rough in their documentation they have this wizard where you can build out 
a basic skeleton for either an ERC-20 console, an ERC-721, or a couple others. And you can pick things like if you want it to be minted, you want the IDs to auto increment, you'll notice like some of this stuff like ownable counters starting to look familiar to what we have in our starter, right? Um, so here you can pick all these things and then just copy paste is a great place to start. It's essentially what we have here with a few things added on for the players. Okay, so starting out, we've got our basic skeleton here. The first thing we need to do is we need to be able to mint an NFT or create an NFT, right? So what does that look like? So we will create a function called safemint. And this is if you want to make sure that everything is right. Safemint is pretty easy if you want to type along. The next function, update URI, copy and paste that. We'll talk about why. But safemint will allow us to mint an NFT to an address. Only the owner of the contract can do that. Here we have some randomness that is like the best randomness that I think I've ever seen. Um, Patrick may feel differently, but you know, where what we do is we get the current number of the block that's being mined right now. It's a really big number. And we just hash that and use that to be our random number. So no one ever knows what the block number is going to be when you run things. It's like guaranteed. All of these things I'm saying about randomness, absolutely wrong. Um, but Patrick will explain it. So you get your random number, and that's going to pick one of the four different characters, right? So we get our random number. We pass it in as this. You know what this little percent sign is called in math terms? Modulo. Yes, modulo. What does it do? That's correct. It gives you the remainder. So we have a really big number, and we divide it by, in this case, the length of our characters array, which is four, right? We'll have a remainder. So based on that remainder, then we'll grab the value at that index location. So the remainder is going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3, right? Because if it's divided by 4, we can have a remainder up to 3. Otherwise, we don't have a remainder. And so based on that, we'll have either 0, 1, 2, or 3. So we're using that to kind of pick our random value. That's kind of how you use a random number, random number, and get it to pick one of the values from the array. Does that make sense? Okay. We then have that list of players here. And we add to it just basically the basic stats for our player. So this player value here is based on this struct, right? So we have image, age, happiness, speed, and wealth. So we put in our image. That's the one that we just got from that random value. And then we're setting all the rest just to one to start out with. This is where if you want to change this so that, you know you don't start playing as a one-year-old, you could do that. Totally fine. We get our token ID from the counter that we imported. We then store that in the value token ID. We increment. Once we've got the value from that counter, then we say, hey, go ahead and increase the counter so the next time we use it, we've got the new value. And then we mint our NFT. So at this point, we have this NFT that's just completely empty. It's completely blank, right? But you have a token with nothing. Then we need to actually update the URI, which is like the metadata behind it. And this is why I said copy and paste this, because in my opinion, this stuff here with like dealing with the metadata JSON string is the most complicated part simply because if you miss one single single quote or double quote or comma in the right spot, like OpenC is going to be like, cool, I have no idea what you're talking about. And you'll see nothing. Um, so just accept the frustration when you've missed a comma and just deal with it. And it, you'll find it eventually and you'll be really proud of yourself or really frustrated, I guess, depending on your personality when you finally find that missing comma. Um, May or may not have taken me like 20 minutes to figure out that I was missing a comma in this exact piece of code here. You know, it's fine. So we've got our URI, our metadata that is going to be used for this NFT. You can see we've got the name, we're just calling it player NFT, a description. We have that image. And this is where we start to reference what we stored in this player's array up here, right? So we have our image, 
our age, and you'll notice we're converting our age to string. So this entire block of information here needs to be all strings. Solidity is very particular about ensuring you are using the right types and you're consistent in your typing. If you try to pass a integer into this, it's gonna complain and throw errors and say, hey, you're trying to use an integer instead of a string. I don't know what to do, right? Cause like I'm expecting a string and this is not a st it's strongly typed. Like it cares about the type of data that you're passing. In. So we've got all this here, all the different pieces, happiness, speed, wealth. We take all of this information and we use this function ABI encode packed. Essentially what that does is this is a collection. It's going to combine them into one big string. Okay, so we have one string of JSON text. Uh, JSON is just the style of, it's like JavaScript object notation, I think. Maybe wrong on that. But it's a type of formatting where you have this key value pairs of like, you know, name, player NFT, description, this is your character. We take all that, we roll it up, we base64 encode it, which is, looks crazy. If you ever look at base64 encoded stuff, it's just like random characters. But the browser, your computer, it knows how to read that. And so it passes that information on, and that's what actually will be rendered the browser through OpenSea. So we get all that stuff. That is stored in our URI value here. We then add a little bit more text to the front of it, letting the software know, hey, this is data of the type application JSON, and it is base64 encoded. We wrap that up into this final token string URI, or final token URI, sorry. And then we set the URI for our token. So we actually set the value for the token to all of this stuff up here. This is a lot. Questions? Nope, you're absolutely correct. I'm not using that in this. Um, I don't know if I use it by the end. That may be leftover code that shouldn't be there. That's probably a very good catch. Any other questions? No? Okay. At this point, if you wanted to deploy this, we could, and we'd have a static NFT. Right? We'd always be age one, we'd always be speed one, wealth one, uh, happiness one, right? But that's, as I said earlier, boring. You know, like if you have a character and it never changes, eh. So we need to now add the ability to age our character. So we add another function here called age. And it's going to take in a token ID. So when you see a function like this and you're passing in a value like this, that's going to be like what's taken into the function, what you pass into the function. So we'll pass in a token ID and then we will use that token ID to add one to the age. And I basically set this up so that every time, every 10 years, happiness and speed increase one. You could do that if you wanted or not. You could have it every time you age once, your happiness increases two. Right? This is essentially saying we're going to take the current level of happiness and then we'll add to it happiness times their age divided by 10. Now, question for you. If my age is 5 and I divide it by 10, what's this value going to return? What's 5 divided by 10? 0.2? Does Solidity understand 0.2? No. So what does Solidity understand? I think somebody, yeah, it's zero, right? Because it doesn't know decimals. And so if you try to do math with decimals, so it is like, I got to this dot thing and like, I just stopped because I don't know. I haven't learned that math yet. So something to keep in mind, when you do math with solidity, there are no decimal places. That's why we have to like artificially put them in like we do with the token, right? Where 10.00 was 1000. We're not doing that here. So if we aren't 
over 10, it's going to be when we divide it by 10. All right, so we've got our function to age. Cool. We change the age, we change the happiness, we change the speed, and then we call this same function that we just looked through a moment ago to update the URI, right? Where we set the string value, and then we update the URI for our token, right? So we reset the metadata for our token, essentially. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're tracking? Cool. Okay, so we've got aging in here. Um, maybe we want to be able to increase and decrease wealth of our player too, might be good. That one is gonna be a real. We just have two functions, gain wealth and, or whatever you want to call them. That's what I call them. Uh, so gain wealth, we're just going to increase by the amount that we pass in. So we pass in two values, the token ID and the amount. And then we update the URI after we update that player's values. And then decrease wealth or lose wealth is essentially the exact same thing except for our plus becomes a minus. So that's the whole contract. I know I've like blazed through this. Questions? Everything makes 100% sense. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So we want to try to deploy this. Y'all want to follow along now? Copy, paste. When you copy, paste, make sure you pick the second one. That's the completed contract. All right. So we go to remix. And this is the same contract. No differences. Yeah. Uh, so if you go here, so not zero, but one, the finished. If you click raw, then you can just copy the whole thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so if you click raw, then you should be able to copy paste the whole thing. Uh, if you scroll down, do you see one? Okay, cool. So we'll put that into Remix. We've used Remix just earlier. So, and I will follow along with you all just to make sure in case I've done something silly somewhere along the way. All right, paste it in. We get our green check mark. That means we don't have any like massive errors, right? At least from a compilation standpoint, it should work. May not do what we think it's going to do, but it should work, right? Like, I don't know. That's why I just, I just feel like green checkmark tells me it's, it's going to work, but it may not do what I'm wanting it to do. So we'll need to deploy this. Uh, if you don't have your MetaMask picked here, make sure you pick that. Uh, you'll need to make sure you have the contract itself, the player NFT, and then we can deploy it. Oh, one side note. I'm going to be on the Fuji test network. Everything is the same for Go Early. Like, it's just, anyway, slightly faster for demo purposes. But Go Early is fantastic. Yes. Yes, still on injected provider. So we have our contract deployed. So, like, everybody deployed their contract? How many of you had deployed an NFT before? And like two. Okay, so how many have deployed an NFT now? Eh. All right. So our contract is deployed. We need to mint an NFT, right? Like we have this contract, but we have no NFTs yet. How do we do that? Well, we'll need our, our wallet address, or if you wanted to send one to someone else, you could put their wallet address in. But you'll need to take your wallet address and put it in Safe Mint. So I went up here to account. I just clicked copy. You could also grab it from your wallet and copy it. And then you want to use the safe mint function. Put your address in there. Confirm that transaction. And once that is confirmed, you should be able to check and see that you actually have a token. So one way to do that is those contracts we imported
from Open Zeppelin. Like, I don't know if y'all noticed, there's a lot of functions here, right? Like that we did not talk about. Most of those come from those contracts we imported. One of them is owner of, you can put in the token ID. Who knows what number computers count from? Zero. zero. So the first token is token zero. So if you click on the owner of and you put in zero here, you should see your wallet address is the owner of the first NFT. Cool. Am I going too fast? Is it? Yeah, everybody good? Okay. So your token is there. Uh, if you want to see the token URI, you can put it in here. And this is what I'm talking about that garbly goop of base 64 encoded data. This looks nothing like what we looked at, does it? But if we take this and copy it, make sure we leave off the string piece. Can we just paste it into our browser window? Something's really cool is now this looks a little more familiar, right? <laughs> We don't need to do this. This is just showing you that like, you know, you can use that for this data. Okay, so we have our NFT created. At this point, we can check it out on OpenSea. OpenSea is working for me. If we copy the address of our NFT contract, so the one that we just deployed, copy that, and we head to testnets.opensea.io, that is probably really tiny. It's testnets.opensea.io. So it is that. You know, I'll read, oops. So we're going to this URL. If we head there and we paste in our contract address, Maybe. Oh no, there we go. Okay, paste it in. We should see. So we have one NFT. Oh man, and it's killing me. Did anybody else get something different than the little Elf with the bow. You got an orc? Okay, cool. What? Okay. The green guy? Okay. A little ogre? Man, it's so random, right? Y'all all got ogres? Totally random. Anyway. Um, so cool. So we've deployed our NFT, right? And we can see like I I think that's really cool. We can see the stats if we go and well, maybe y'all can. If we go down to levels. You can see all the information about your NFT, right? So if we go back to the mix, we could gain if we put in a thousand and make sure we specify the token ID for the one that's and do that transaction. We should be able to modify. Now, one thing to keep in mind, OpenSea caches data. That means they kind of, and then when you come and look at it, they just show you that same picture unless you ask them to update that picture. So when you change the metadata behind your NFT, you'll need to click this refresh metadata button. That'll cause OpenSea to go back out to the and say, hey, what's the current data? And then you'll need to refresh the page, maybe. And you should see, that the wealth changed by however much you incremented it. So now we have a character we can do stuff with, right? Like you could use this in a role-playing game. You can make your own D and D NFT. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I mentioned though that I'm lazy, and aging seems to happen on its own, right? Like, how many of you click a button every birthday? Yeah, okay, you too. Okay, well, yeah, me too. I just I got another year click and gray hair starts showing up. So we can age our by putting in the ID, or token by putting in the ID and clicking age. 
in doing this and making sure we come back every year and do this, right? And that gets really annoying. And then when I'm trying to keep track of these, that gets really annoying. So let's find out how to actually automate this. So we're going to use Chainlink Keepers to automate this. So if you head to keepers.chain.link, keepers with two E's, dot chain dot link. Everybody got link earlier when you were getting your test net, Heath, because you'll need some. So keepers.chain.link, you should see, not this. Let me disconnect all these real quick. You should see something like this, where it says connect wallet. Yours, though, will say Ethereum go early, right? So you'll need to click connect wallet. I'll ask you to use MetaMask. And then you will connect your wallets. You should register a new upkeep. Here we go. So right-hand corner, there's a connect wallet button. You're going to pick MetaMask. Click connect, and then you'll have the ability to click this register new upkeep button. We good? Type in our MetaMask passwords. We're good, yeah? Okay, so register new upkeep. There's a question about what it meant about the upkeeps earlier. We have two types of upkeeps. One is time-based. Uh, they're very simplistic. They're based on cron schedule. We'll take a look at those. because, And then we have custom logic. Custom logic upkeeps uh, are more of that event-based upkeep where you'll have two functions, a up perform upkeep function Check upkeep function is going to check if whatever things you want to be true are true, right? Like enough time has passed or a balance is too low. Uh, the speaker is rambling for too long. Whatever information you want to check will return a Boolean, true or false. If it's, then it will perform the upkeep and actually run the upkeep. Time-based upkeep is just going to be based on, is it this current time? If it is, run the thing that we want to automate. So we'll be using that. So you'll pick time-based upkeep. Our contract address. So remember, we can grab that here. Remix, we can copy it from here. Paste it in. And we will click next. It can't fetch the ABI. ABI is a application binary. It's essentially how know to talk to each other. It's like an API, if you're familiar with those. Uh, we can grab that from Remix as well. So if we head back to Remix and we go to our compiler tab, and we make sure we have the right contract selected here, there is a button here, ABI. If you just click that, it'll copy it all into your clipboard. Back to Keepers. And we'll paste it in. Essentially what this is doing is it's exposing all of those different functions, letting the Keepers Network know what functions it can call. So all of those functions that we see in Remix on the left here, it's letting other applications know about what all is available here. So we paste it in here and we click Next. And you can see now we have the ability to call a whole bunch of functions. That's what our ABI basically told the Keepers Network is like, hey, these are all the things that we can do. So we're going to call age. And we're going to pass in the token ID for our token that we minted. So token zero. Questions? Yeah. So for example, the next show or the snow, summer, or the Yes. So basically, we can automate what this NFT looks like based on these keepers that we're implementing right now. So these keepers would, when you check to update it. Uh, gotcha. Yes. Sure. 
So we'll click next. And then we have our cron expression here. Uh, there is a website, crontab guru, that will break down crontab in human readable format. Right, so instead of like five, four, star, 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 it says at 405. That makes a lot more sense to me. Um, but we have some examples here too. And for this, we'll click the every 15 minutes example. And if you want to change it to every one minute, essentially what this is saying is every minute that's divisible by one, right? So every minute that's easily divisible by 15 is at the 0, 15, 30, 45. We change it to one, three, one minute. So you want to, is that too small for you? So it should be, click on every 15 and just take away the five. From there, you can kind of see a layout of when the next times it will run. This is kind of like just to check and make sure that you're setting this up the way that you are expecting. You'll click and We need to fill out some information. So we need a name for a, you can name it whatever you want, Smart Con Workshop. Yes. Correct. Yes, it would be on every fifth minute of the hour. Yes, so if you, five minutes, then yeah, it would be every fifth minute of the hour. It's not dependent on when you start it. It's dependent on like, so the stars in every minute divisible by five evenly is what you're saying. So gas limits. This is where in demo world, I'm just gonna put the maximum amount because I'm spending free money. In real world, you'd want to make sure that you're picking a limit that is reasonable for what you're doing, right? So if we look back at Remix when we did things like age, you can actually see here it spent, right? So this gives you an idea of how expensive this is in terms of gas. But for this one, I'm just going to put a ridiculously high limit. Uh, the starting link balance, this will be the link that you got from the test faucet earlier. So start with five, put in email address, because if you're goes too low, it will email you and let you know. And you can put a project name if you want. We'll register our upkeep. We'll click that button down at the bottom. We'll confirm twice as we deploy the job and we request the upkeep itself. And at this point, we've taken our contract, let the keepers network know about it and ask the keepers network to automate contract. Get old really fast because every minute he's getting one more. I guess I didn't specify if it was years, but maybe it's minutes old. So we've got our upkeep registered. We can view our upkeep and within this screen, we can see the history, all the details about how much our balance is when it's going to be run next, what our actual cron expression was in case we forgot. We have our history here, shows that we, if we maybe, if we, yes, so we've already seen one minute go by. So we've automatically called. So remember he was at two? Yeah, we aged him once. So he should have been at two. If we read now, and refresh this page, he's at three. So every minute now our NFT is going to change all by itself. Like this example is getting older, right? Like it's kind of a basic example, but I think this is really cool in that you can take something like this on chain, make it do things automatically. I don't know, I think that's really cool. Um, what questions do y'all have? We'll start with you. It hasn't updated yet. I'll say Gorley does sometimes take a little bit longer. That may be part of it. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, it is. So Chainlink Oracle, distributed Oracle nodes, the Don, is essentially a network of Chainlink nodes that then run the VRF keepers data feeds. Yeah, sure. Yes. It would fluctuate, yes. Yeah. So it would be replacing the URI, but you could still see what the old is. Like, if you think about it like a bank ledger, the blockchain, all the old information is still there but you've kind of replaced what we're referencing for that token now. So I don't know. Yes, I guess to your question, like, yes, it kind of does create a new one, but it, the new one is the, is the one. Does that make sense? Cause we have, we have a history of what it was and then we have what it is now. So like, if you can, I don't know if you can say that creating a new one or just updating, I guess anytime you update, you're creating a new one. Sure. So look at what this actually looks like. Um, let's go, I don't remember what the Fuji block explorer. So for go early, this will look different. Very similar, but different. Um, which piece would you like to see? So we have, oops, oh, oh no. So these are the transactions we can take a look at. Here, it's not going to be super duper helpful. Look at it though. But this is where that would be calling that function. Okay. Question over here. Mm -hmm. So IPFS, when we look at IPFS, this hash here is static. So you can't update it. If you wanted to have something like that where you could update it, you would need to use not PFS. Like, a, yes. Okay, sure. Yes, essentially until we run out of link. Like, it'll just keep going. So, like, I don't know what it is now, but this whole time it's been ticking along. It's where you went 256 maximum number is, yeah. yes. Did... Yeah, so this image say it's a standing character. Is it a way for the little guy to earn the arrow and it earn the cape and then have the image change for the dragon to marry it on the image? Yes, so you can, in the same way that you change, in the same way that you change here, so we changed like the age, for example, here, you could change the value that you're passing in. Because every time you update the URI, you could update everything. So you could have an asset with like no cape, no arrows, an asset with cape, no arrows, an asset with both. And so you could change that as they level up. Yes. Yes. You'd have separate, like, uh, complete images. Yeah, so not like three images on top of each other, but like uh, a level one image, a level two image, a level three image. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. So you could approach that several different ways. You could create different upkeep for each token. Really, not what you want to do. Um, or you could have the like the age function, for example, could check which tokens, which NFTs need to age or it could age all of the NFTs. So it, from what you're asking about having like a dashboard of which tokens have aged, that is not no, unless you created an upkeep for each token. If I'm understanding your question, is that answer? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. For the upkeep, so it should check every block. Like the way keepers works, it checks every block to see if it needs to perform keep. Yeah. So, well, you could actually if you put it in the code require block dot or block dot number. Yeah. Is and then it would just run that block. What's that? Multiple blockchains, not uh, just to clarify your question, like blockchain is kind of in a silo, yes. Like the ones that are supported, uh, the easiest way to show that. So you head to the documentation and you go to supported networks. So this is where they are currently. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Do you need? Here, you next. We got questions. One more. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. No, um, that is like an upper limit of what it will do. So, if you notice, if we go back here to the one we just did, right? I set my gas limit very high. That's going to be where the like minimum balance comes in. So my minimum balance is fairly high as well, because that's going to be based on the maximum gas that it could spend. If you look at like how much it's actually spending though, that's way less than like one dot. What was it? One and 1.6. So what's actually using will be just based on a regular transaction. Yes, yeah. If it's too high, if it's above it, then it won't run. Cool. Anything else? So right here, actions. You can either edit it, edit the gas limit, put more in, or cancel it. So we will give our player the fountain of youth, and now they will stop aging. All right. We have a 15 minute break. Okay. All right. Well, well transition.
Okay.
La la la. Oh, now it should be good. Test. Test. All right, I'm just going to use the internal microphone. It's a little bit quieter, but hopefully you guys on stream are okay. All right, cool. All right, cool. Um, I'll just talk really loud, I guess. And yeah. Um, so yeah, so the reason blockchain and smart contracts are so cool is they give us these trust minimization, right? They give us these unbreakable promises. They give us a level of transparency that doesn't exist in the Web2 world, right? In Web2, when you make an agreement with somebody, when you say, hey, you know, I will, um, uh, I'll buy your product for some service, whatever service they're doing is behind closed doors, right? You, you're not 100% sure what they're doing because there's no transparency. And a perfect example of this is with a lottery. When you buy a lottery ticket, what are you actually buying? You're buying a fair chance at winning a million dollars. But where does the random winner picking happen? Do you get to see it? You have no idea. There's zero, absolutely zero transparency. And this is something blockchain solves. Blockchain has full transparency. Right? These unbreakable promises because it's encoded on the blockchain for us to see. And we've seen this lack of transparency affect us in almost every aspect of our lives at one point or another. And one of the examples that I usually use that's the most understandable is this lottery example. So back in the 80s and 90s, McDonald's ran this uh, ad campaign called the uh, McMillions or the McDonald Monopoly. Some of you remember this, where you, you walk in, you buy your McFood or whatever, and you get a little Monopoly thing, right? And if you get enough trains on the board or whatever, you win a million dollars. Sounds great. And a ton of people bought McDonald's because of this, because they said, hey, I'm trying to win the million. Came to find out that between 13 and $24 million of this McDonald's Monopoly money went to not the people buying the food, but a group of criminals who were doing the winner selection behind closed doors and just picking themselves every single time, right? <laughs> Huge lack of transparency. So at the end of my talk here, hopefully uh, I will have convinced you that given the opportunity to choose a system where you have to trust somebody going behind closed doors and doing something versus choosing an algorithm that will transparently and cryptographically guarantee you a fair result you will always choose this one, given the choice between the two. And hopefully your friends and family will understand that as well. When you say, hey, would you rather me go behind this closed door, pick a random winner, or just have the math do it for you? They're always going to choose the math. <clears throat> oh, yeah, your, your chance to win was zero. Zero percent chance <laughs> to win the uh, McDonald's Monopoly lottery, in case that wasn't, uh, wasn't already clear. And so Richard was showing us that we can get random numbers in the blockchain, but he was showing us a not secure version of randomness. Shocker, I'm sorry he lied to you, although he also was like, I'm lying to you, so I guess he told the truth to you. Um, and something that we can do to solve this is using something called Chainlink VRF, or Chainlink Verifiable Randomness Function. When you use RNG on the blockchain, inside the blockchain, blockchains are deterministic by nature. And with that definition, you can't have a random number in a deterministic system. That defeats the purpose of randomness. If you can predict what the number is, it's not really random. So inside your blockchain, you can't have a random number, which is why we need to look outside the blockchain, which is where Chainlink Oracles come into play. A Chainlink Oracle can then 
verifiably guarantee that the number is random using some cryptographic magic. And we'll, we'll show you that in a little bit. Chainly VRF provides random, uh, verifiable randomness. And a ton of applications uh, use this. One of my favorite ones is this one called Pool Together, which is a DeFi protocol where you put money in and it goes off and invests your money for you. And then every week it picks a winner. Um, and that winner gets all the savings, all the yield earned for that week. Um, and it's a really cool protocol because the expected outcome is actually positive. It's a fun way to invest, a really cool protocol. But we see a lot of other protocols as well. Um, for example, many NFT applications use Chainlink VRF to get random numbers, get random stats, build provable scarcity uh, into their NFTs like uh, Avagochis, Axie Infinity, uh, Ether Cards, Pokemon, et cetera. And um, so that's kind of the, the precursor to everything. Now we're going to jump into a real scenario. So you guys have been here for today. You've been learning some solidity. It's time to put what you've learned to the test. So this QR code on screen and this link here, you have the next 10 minutes to exploit it. This contract address has this code here. It's called contract bad lottery uh, because surprise, surprise, it's not gonna be a good lottery. <laughs> Where we use some on-chain randomification to pick a random number and pick a winner. So this line right here, if we zoom in, lock to it. Doing this UN256 random number equals this weird hashing stuff of the block difficulty and block timestamp. Uh, and this percent thing is called a modular function, which basically just means that um, this random number can be any number between, excuse me, zero and 100,000. In Solidity, you can do kind of these cool little underscores to separate the three zeros, which is kind of nice, makes it more readable. So this function here, enter lottery, you enter a guess in, uh, hopefully you would enter a guess between zero and 100,000. And if your guess is this random number, you get set to be the winner, the winner of this contract. So right now, if we go to read contract, uh, unless some of you already beat it, which would be very surprising, and my internet decides to work. If we go to read contract, if we go to winner, right now it's nobody. However, in this code, and this is on Grilly, right? So uh, go to faucets.chain.link, get some testnet ETH if you haven't already. Um, you can enter a guess, if, and if you go to the write contract tab in either scan, once it shows up, or maybe it never will. Uh, you can connect to Web3, hit this connect to Web3, swap, go to my MetaMask, go to connect, next, connect. I can now put a guess in here. I'm going to put one, two, three, or one, two. I'm going to hit right. I'm going to refresh, actually, because it's being very slow. Connect to Web3. Okay. MetaMask. Good. Guess. Number three. Right. And a mouse is going to pop up. And I'm going to send it. So this is me making the guess of one, two, three. Now, since you guys saw the code here, you know that, um, or you just trusted me, which you showed in the state, um, that the possible chance of me winning this is hypothetically one in 100,000, right? Because that's what my random number is going to be between zero and 100,000. However, you can actually have a one out of one chance of getting this random number, because this actually isn't a random number at all. So yeah, so five, five to 10 minutes, have fun. Try to exploit this. Try to be the winner. Yes, 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 yes. Here's the QR code. You all have five to 10 minutes to try to exploit this. You all need to put your security and hacker hats on. What can you do? <laughs> Brownie points or something. What's that? 
Anytime I say brownies now, I think of, <laughs> I think of that, <laughs> I think of the Python framework. All right, let's go see. Let's see if people are sending transactions here. Okay, people are, transactions are coming in. People are trying to, trying to win. Let's see, has anyone won yet? Nope. I know, right? <laughs> there is a chance somebody actually accidentally wins. We can't edit the code. I thought we just need to edit the code. This contract is on chain. This, you can't, this is, this is immutable. You can't change this contract, but you can pick the random winner. But, but how can you do that? Or maybe you can't. Yeah, we'll go to, um, I don't know, 32 or something, 232. Who here thinks they, they have an idea of how to exploit this? Who here is like, I have no clue. This is witchcraft and wizardry. <laughs> All right, call people. Who here didn't raise their hand? Nice, okay. <laughs> all right, all right, there we go. What's up? Uh, hint, remix, what's your hint? Hint number two, code. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, he's picking up what I'm putting down. Go. We'll go for three more minutes, actually. It was a three. Do you remember earlier when we made a contract call another contract? Oh. <laughs> That's a big. No winners yet. Oh, we got some people teaming up. I like that strategy. That's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, question shit on the line. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you can try. Do whatever you want. Oh, oh, sorry. Can we you can do for the people in the chat asking, you do whatever you want to try to figure it out. All you got to do is be the winner. Just be the winner. And then if you do get the winner, just like stand up and be like, I'm the winner. <laughs> like, Bingo. No winner yet. <clears throat> What's up? Random number equals guess. Winner equals message dot sender. Keep hearing like on a uh, on a monopia is of like <laughs> oh yeah, figures out. Oh.
Alright, raise your hand if you want two more minutes. Raise your hand if you're like, nah, I'm done. Okay, we'll do two more minutes. Two more minutes. Uh, Overthinking it. Um, I, I was just going to import that one. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you could just import the ABI and then call it. Then we're running on the I don't say anything. I just breathed. Should I go to I go to three, right? I forget the schedule. I, I think I go to three. Yes. Even if I cheated and got a text from a friend, should I say it or no? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm about to explain it anyway, so yeah. All right. All right, y'all. Fingers down, pencils, pencils down. Um, what's that? 315. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so uh, ch challenges like this, by the way, uh, everyone should come to Friday's Hacker House. Uh, we're going to have a ton of really fun challenges like this. They start off much easier than this. Um, and they, they get harder, um, but uh, yeah, I love little little fun challenges like this. So I, I heard a lot of you pretty much getting it, but not sure how to put it in. So in this code here, what do we see? Okay, we see we're getting this random number we're, and we're getting it from a hash of the block difficulty and the block timestamp. Now, if you're unfamiliar with hashes, okay, that might make it a little bit more complicated, but a hash is gonna be the exact same every single time. It's basically, you're just mixing up some data and you're getting this, this string. So I heard some people go, hey, if I know the block difficulty and the block timestamp, do I know the random number? And the answer is basically yes, right? If you know them, you can guess what the, the random number is. But what, was, what we were having a hard time putting into, uh, into code, into, into guessing here is, is how do we actually do this, right? If you go to the contract, like I was showing you, if I do one, two, three, Four, five, six, I'm going to have a one in 100 chance. But what we can do is we see here, right on this line, this is how this random number was picked. And um, I've got a, oh, I should have put a QR code up here too. Um, and, I've, and I've seen a lot of protocols use some type of randomness like this before and get hacked for a lot of money. So this is your PSA. Do not use this as a random number because I'm about to show you how I'm going to get the random number and be the winner like that, right? And here's a, an example of where this happened in the wild, where somebody used um, you know, this type of randomness to get a random number, boom, it was an NFT project, and uh, some, somebody
<laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yep. Oh, oh, that means somebody probably won then. Um, what did I do? Full screen? Touch screen. Okay. So if somebody got a revert, that means somebody probably got the random number. Yeah, somebody won. Somebody won? Yeah. Hey, who won? Somebody copied What's up? Someone on the Okay. All right. Congrats, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, so, so somebody won. Good job to whoever you are out there. Um, but let's let's break this down. So let's just do it all in um, in Remix. Then. So I'm going to deploy this uh, uh, this to my virtual environment here. So now we have this bad lottery. It's the exact same, right? If I do one, two, three, enter lottery, you know the winner is going to be zero. Uh, hopefully you all can see this on the side. I know it's a little small. Can I zoom in on that? Not really. Okay, whatever. Um, what we can do is we can, okay, let's use what we know here to make our own contract that will do the exact same thing and then just put it into our own contract. So we're gonna make a new contract. We're gonna call it, oh, not an artifact. Close that up. We'll call it um, pat exploit. I already made one called exploit. That's all with the answer. I'm just gonna copy this because I don't feel like typing that. Contract. At exploit like this. And so what we can do is if we go to our bad lottery, we can see, okay, this lottery has this uh, enter lottery function and we can have our contract call this. Now we didn't really talk about interfaces uh, um, before, but uh, you could have made like an interface type thing. Um, an interface is, is just a way for us to, um, to interact with another contract um, and to call another contract's function. So we saw with uh, with what Richard was doing, with some of the other presenters were doing, how we can actually have contracts call other contracts, right? So we're gonna use this interface and we have one function, function to enter lottery. So I'm just gonna copy this, put it in my exploit, external, and boom. Now that we have this interface, we can call that contract with our own contract. So in our contract, we'll do a function called attack, and we'll just have it pass the address of the lottery. Make this public. And in here, we'll just say, okay, at our um, at our lottery address. So we're going to wrap our lottery address in this interface, which is how we can call it. Uh, we're going to do dot. That's the name of the function. Dot guess. Oh, and dot enter lottery. Go back to the exploit, paste it here, and now we're just doing the exact same thing to get the random number, which isn't really random. We'll grab this, copy it, paste it. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, total size. Total size is what, 100,000? So we'll do 100,000. Boom. So now, if we actually deploy, so we have our bad lottery here. Right now, there's no winner. Let's go ahead and deploy our exploit. We'll deploy it. So now we have our bad lottery and our pat exploit. We'll take this contract address of our lottery. Remember the winner right now is nobody. We'll paste it in here. Boom. We'll call it tack function. Taco Sue. And now we're the winner. So we have successfully done our first exploit in just day one of learning solidity. Wow, you guys are, <laughs> guys are learning quick. Great work, everybody. So uh, so this is clearly a, a bad form of randomness and we can see exactly right here why, right? So remember, everything on chain is deterministic. So keep that in mind when you're working with randomness, you do not want to use a system like this. I'm going to show you guys how we can use Chainlink VRF to get a verifiably random number that is immune to attacks like this. Uh, questions before we do that though, why yes. Why time the same? Any yes, so when I run this transaction, um, block.timestamp is going to be the same in this part of the transaction as the other, other part. Because with the way the transaction, the way the code works, it's going to the same block. 
it's going, it's, it's happening the exact same block at the exact same time, right? Because this code is calling the other code, right? So this, you can imagine this block dot timestamp variable, it's set right at, right when the, like at the beginning of the transaction. So every single time you see block the timestamp in the rest of the transaction, it's going to be the same. So it'll be the same here. And then this contract pat exploit will call bad lottery, which again, block the timestamp is going to be the exact same as it was before. So it's going to be the same throughout the entire transaction. So why not call system What's that? Why not call system time? Block the timestamp yeah, is the equivalent of system time in the blockchain world. So because, because in, in sys time, that's like on your local computer. Block that timestamp is like the timestamp of the blockchain, which is like this decentralized network. So if you were to call system time on like an individual node, well, the blockchain doesn't care what time it is on your node. It only cares what time it is on the blockchain. Great question. Any other questions? Who's like, this makes sense to me? Who's like, this is witchcraft? <laughs> and if it is, it's fine. Okay, okay, both. <laughs> this makes sense to me, but it's also witchcraft. I love it. Okay, cool. So now that we know how this is insecure randomness, let's go to docs.chain.link and let's figure out how we can get true randomness, right? And so this will be helpful so that we can have those transparent lotteries. We can have those applications that need random numbers that actually are random, right? So if we go to docs.chain.link, uh, real similar to what you know, Richard, Sol, and everybody has been showing so far, we just scroll down to using randomness. Excuse me, and we can go to uh, get a random number. And there's a button somewhere down here, and this is the whole code that we need to get a random number with channel. And we can just hit this button, open a remix, drop the code in remix for us. Why? Because copying pasting is too much work for me. So just hit the button. <laughs> But here we are back in Remix, and we're going to have all the Chainlink code uh, loaded up once my internet wants to cooperate. All right, cool. So we have all this code here. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief rundown of how it works, and then we'll see it in action. So uh, what's happening is at the top, we're importing a whole bunch of Chainlink stuff. Um, for all intents and purposes, you can just see, hey, this is some um, back for, uh, uh, skeleton code to have chain link work, right? You kind of can ignore it. Um, and we have our contract do this is mentality. So it's going to inherit all the functionality of this code that we just pulled in. And then we just kind of have a whole bunch of configurable, configurable parameters um, that I'm going to explain in a minute. Uh, all, these, all these are just configurable parameters, which I will explain. Uh, the main bread and butter, though, happens in this request random words function, which I know is kind of small. This is a, a function that's going to submit a transaction in, submit a request in one transaction, and it's going to wait actually for the Chainlink node to respond in a second transaction. So Chainlink VRF is actually a two transaction process. So we send, we, we make one transaction to emit the request, and then we wait a little bit, and then the Chainlink node response, right? And this is good, again, because if it all happens in the same transaction, then as we just saw, we can just go, okay, I'm just going to do the exact same thing that that first transaction did. Boom, I, I have the, the winning number here. Um, and with the chain link node, we can pick how many random numbers we want. We can pick, um, we can set up uh, uh, how much gas limit we want. We can do the number of confirmations. There's all this configurable stuff, and um, I'll show you how to do this. So, what we can do is we're going to switch over to Injective Web 3. We're going to switch to MetaMask. Oops, I've got to compile this first. Let's compile this. Whatever that wants to compile. And there's a, there's a random number. Sorry, one sec. I'm just going to add one piece to it. So this this S request thing is a uh, a mapping, but that can be a little bit tricky to to view. So we're just going to save. Um, we're going to do a uh, unit 256 last rand 
equals, excuse me. So just to make it easier for this demo, it'll it'll work fine without uh, adding this. Last rand equals random words of zero. And I'm just going to do this. Let's say you want to get six last rand uh, public. This gets us the, just one of the random numbers, saves it to a global variable so we can easily read it. So I'm going to compile. Let's go ahead and um, go to deploy. Now, to deploy this, it takes this parameter called the subscription ID. So to work with Chainlink VRF, we actually have to work with another contract called the VRF coordinator. So this is a, a, another contract on Ethereum, Avalanche, you know, whatever testnet that coordinates getting the random numbers back to us. So for us to work with that, we can go to vrf.chain.link. And this is just a helpful UI to help interact with this, this contract on chain that helps us get random numbers back. So what we can do, we can zoom in a little bit. We can just hit this create subscription button. And this will create a subscription for us. And it'll have pretty much all the configurable parameters that we want uh, right in here. So let's go ahead and create a subscription. MetaMask is gonna pop up. So we're calling this create subscription function on this contract on chain to set this up. We'll go ahead and confirm. And this is gonna set us up a subscription for our wallet address, right? So my wallet address is now going to get its own unique subscription ID that we can use to get random numbers. And then we get to kind of chill out, wait for a little bit. I really wants to. Uh, uh, of which one? Yes. So if you go to docs.chain.link. What's that? Uh, yeah, so, so I was adding on, on the pad, uh, if you have the pad. But um, yeah, docs.chain.link, and just scroll down to get a random number. Um, and then you scroll down, there's like an open and remix button uh, that you'll get it. All right, cool. So now our subscription has been created. And to get our random numbers, um, kind of similar to keepers, we have to fund it with link. Right? Every time we make a request, we spend a little chain link token. Um, I currently have no link, so faucet stuff chain to link. Whoops, I forgot to give myself a link. I'm gonna have to log into Twitter, aren't I? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uncheck the eat. Right. Okay, yay. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, I'm gonna have to like stop sharing screen. I'm gonna put in my back, right? <laughs> bunnies. This is this is the real test. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I get all the bunnies? <laughs> oh wait. Oh, did they? Oh, um, I'm screwed. Oh my god. They know I'm a bot. <laughs> They know I'm not him. <laughs> I always have my suspicions. <laughs> <laughs> or I just have to refresh. Oh, I should have it. Oh, no. Had it. I fooled them. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Round two. All right. House covered in snow. I was going to say, it's like focusing so hard there. Okay, here we go. All right, get, getting me some links so I can fund the VRF subscription. This is the easy part of the demo here, just uh, uh, depending on Wi Fi cooperation. But yeah, if you like little puzzles, be sure to come to the Hacker House. None of you are going to finish all of my 
proposals. <laughs> Unless you're a wizard, in case, in which case we will hire you if you get all 20. We will be very impressed. Because it's impossible. Yeah, and then once we get our, our tokens in here, we'll come back over to the VR of Craigslist subscription. We'll add some funds in here. We'll get a subscription ID, and then back in Remix, that's what we're going to drop um, into into here for a subscription ID. Because in order for our, our random number to get uh, a random, in order for our contract to get a random number, uh, we need to have a subscription. So let's go back to Gorilla. Now that I hit refresh. Recent subscriptions, my subscription, I have this subscription ID 2737. So I'm going to add funds to it. We'll add 10, it's way more than I need, but maybe it's just my laptop that's slow. Oh, it's just everybody. Okay. All right. Well, you all get to be slow on the Wi Fi with me. So while that's going through, it's sub ID uh, 2737. And then I can go back to Remix. And just pop that in here, 2737, deploy. And that's going to pop up. I'm going to deploy this to the Gorilla testnet. Go early. Gorilla, go early. Go early. Uh, yes. Go or lie. Go or lie. Yeah. Yes. We should have a competition to see who can say testnet names the most wrong. <laughs> well, Potentially being right. <laughs> so we're launching this. And um, as I was saying before, it's, it's got a ton of different uh, configurable parameters. You can read them in the docs. The big ones are going to be this thing called key hash, uh, which is known as the gas lane. It's going to specify the maximum gas you can spend, like just in case gas prices spike and you're like, oh, I'm not trying to pay a million guay for my random number. Uh, you have callback gas limit, which is the amount of gas that you you're willing to spend request confirmations are how many block confirmations in order for your random number to be like okay it's solid now the number excuse me number of words is the number of random numbers you want and etc so now that we have this uh, and we have our our vrf funded we can now do something called add consumer so we've added link we've created a, a contract and now we can say okay the contract that can request random numbers from you is the one that we just deployed. So we copy that address, paste it in here, add consumer. And yes, for those of you who are curious, you don't have to use the UI at all for this. Um, if you're super savvy, you can just have a script that does all this behind, uh, behind the scenes. And that's normally what I do uh, when I'm coding something serious. I just have a script that adds consumer, creates subscription, funds, blah, 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 all that stuff. Most of the uh, starter kits, if you're familiar with like Hard Hat, Foundry, Brownie, et cetera, they have some type of scripting feature that allows you to automate a lot of this process so you don't have to sit and wait on the UI. You can just say, you know, fun, create subscription, et cetera, and be good to go. All right, cool. Consumer added. Now what I can do back in Remix is I created this, this number called Last Rand. Uh, right now it's nothing, right, because we, we don't have a random number. But what I can do is we can call this request randomness function now, request random words. And what's going to happen is, like I said, we're going to send that request and we're going to have to wait for the chain link node to respond with our random number. Oh, actually, I didn't need to put the last random. in. I forgot there's a, there's a last request ID that we could have used, but I'll show that as well. So now, after, now that we sent the request, if we go back to our subscription, we do a little refresh here. We should see the UI be like, hey, a request has been initialized. And there has, right? There's been there's now this pending request, pending for eight seconds, nine seconds, however quickly the Wi-Fi wants to go. And once the chain link node gets this request, sees that this has been finalized on chain, it's gonna go, okay, great. It's gonna deliver us a random number back um, through this contract called the Bureau of Coordinator. This is a contract on chain, you can check it out. Um, it uses a lot of kind of public key cryptography to guarantee that our random number is in fact random and not gameable. So if you're curious on how it kind of works on the hood, be sure to go check that, that contract out.
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, a lot of people uh, didn't want to, have to script everything out, and they wanted a UI to get their random numbers. Um, so that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's 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 kind of new. It's it's uh, it's constantly being updated because it is kind of nice to have like the visual cues and stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the story. Good question. Any other questions while we, while we pen here? Great question. So if we scroll down, we have our fulfill random words function here. This is what the chain link node is actually calling. And I, I say calling with quotes for uh, reasons you'll understand in a second. So this before random words function is actually overriding a function that we uh, we call that we inherit from the fear of consumer base. And in our fear of consumer base, I'm not going to go to it because the Wi-Fi is being slow. It'll take me too many clicks. But in the fear of consumer base, there's a function called like raw fulfill random words or something like that, and it has um, basically like a modifier on it that says, "Hey, make sure that the random number is coming from." Um, uh, it has, has a proof and it's only coming from the VRF coordinator. So that's how we know we're only getting it from the VRF coordinator with a cryptographic proof that guarantees the numbers random. So great question. Thank you for asking. And I believe we've, we've successfully sent the request. I don't know if we've successfully got a response. I see success, so we probably did. If I hit last ran now. We have a random number here, and what I could have just done was hit last request, hit this request, paste it into here, seed our fulfilled true, exists true, um, paste it in here. Oh no, sorry, that would be zeros request that is. Get requested, he paste it in here, and then we get the random words. So we paste the um, the last request ID into this get request, uh, what's the name of the function? Get request, get request status, which gives us the random word um, and the fulfilled number of random numbers. So I didn't need to add this last rand, but that can make it easier if you're like really confused as to what's going on. So that's how we get random numbers. And now we have solved the lottery issue. We can now create a provably mathematically guaranteed fair lottery with a true random number. And we can fix that. I'm going to go share my full screen again. Thanks, Richard. Cool. Any other questions? So, uh, so how fast is this random number generator? Let's say, for example, the, the Ethereum node is busy and then uh, the gas prices are going crazy. Yeah. And you said to wait for the three confirmation. Yep. So how realistic this is? So Great question. So really at the end of the day, it depends on how 
fast with blockchains. So Ethereum, for example, right now has an average block time of like 12 seconds, which means the absolute fastest you can get a random number back is 24 seconds. Because you have to wait 12 seconds for the request to go through, and then another 12 seconds for the response. But that also depends on gas, right? Because if you set like a max gas limit of five or something like that, and or, or, or a max, excuse me, a max gas price of five or something like that, and um, the gas prices are currently seven, it will just sit in queue until the gas prices come down. Um, so there's a lot of factors that um, can make it take shorter or longer. But the biggest one is is the is the blockchain itself. So like for example, Polygon um, block times are like one or two seconds. So you, the maximum waiting time will be like three seconds, right? So it, it depends on the blockchain. Good, great question, really good question. Any other questions? Yes. I was thinking of, of back in like 2017, 18, uh, there was a lot of um, bad actors reselling ledger hardware wallets on the internet. And you had no idea that seed had leaked or been truthfully generated. So I'm thinking with a, you know, verifiably random numbers, is there a way to extrapolate that to verifiably random seed phrases? That's a great question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, that's a great question because yeah, that, that's a big issue with you see all these like uh, like proof vanity profan What was the name of the, yeah. the vanity the vanity creator? They recently got hacked for not having a um, a verifiably random private key generator thing. Um, great question. I mean, right now in its current state, it wouldn't make sense because all the everything that gets output is put on chain for everyone to see. So if you made a seed phrase that everyone can see, it's not very useful. Um, I don't know. Um, I would love to see research. Great question. I'd love to plug, plug my ledger in or use Ledger Live. You know, you can check authenticity in your hardware wallet. Mm. Just call it, you know, white fix. I don't, I don't trust uh, you know, Ledger for yeah. having that seed not having any. Yeah, 100%. And that's yeah. Cool, so. or, or them having like, um, like a, I mean, if you, there, a lot of their software is closed source, right? So, yeah, spot on. Or is it? Is it all? I forget. Actually, don't don't call me on that. I forget. It might be open source. It'll eventually be open source. Yes, eventually, probably. Yes. So if you want to get ten random numbers mm -hmm. uh, separately that are not repeating, how would you do that? Yeah. So for ten random numbers that are not repeating. Oh, for, so from zero to nine, uh, so you would do that modular function that we showed before, and that will get you like a range of zero to you have at the end of that modular function, basically. Um, to make them non-repeating, you would just, uh, every time you get a number, you would add it to like an array, you would check to see if it's in that array, so there you just like add one. Um, because every number that the chain link returns is gonna be a random number, right? So there is a chance that it'll, it would repeat. So you would just do the checking kind of in your, in, after it's filled. And then, yeah, if it's already there, it's bump it up by one or two or whatever. Good question. Any other questions? All right, cool. So a question for you. Who, who enjoyed like taking the, the seven minutes to like find the exploit? Who thought that was fun? Who was like, ah, just shut up and tell me the answer next time, just, just go. All right, so so fun things are fun. Oh no, he's like he's like ah, oh, get your wisdom. Oh, no question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, get your get your witchcraft out of here. Yeah, what a question. No, I didn't have a question. What's that? I like Okay, okay. All right, cool. All right, awesome. All right, cool. Well, then I guess that's it for me. We have another fifteen minute break. We yes, we will come back in uh, Thursday at half. 3.30? Yes. Okay, cool. So we have like a 20 minute break. See you back here at 3.30. Uh, for Andre, it's going to play another, even more fun game than the one that I did. So excited for that. See you guys soon.
raise your hand for the online participants. Also, if you cannot hear me well, just enter in the chat or, and we are gonna, we are gonna handle everything. I must be here. Okay, because of the camera. Hi, online participants. Okay, uh, for the online participants and you as well, who here does not have Gourly Eat in his or her wallet? Gourly Eat. We're all good? Whoever don't have Gourly Eat, please go to faucets.chain.link. So faucets.chain.link, connect your wallet and grab some. You're gonna need it for the game in your wallet uh you only need the computer but you can have a cell phone as well if you want if you have mobile wallet in your on your machine installed okay so today uh we are gonna for the like a final event today we are gonna play the game so the idea is that um we are gonna combine everything you learned today to create a game so your job for today for this particular event is to just play the game so no coding. Uh, I know like you're probably uh, exhausted to code from, from, the, from, from the morning basically. So I coded the game. I created, uh, I used all of these principles that Saul, Richard and Patrick taught you during this day. And we'll just uh, see how everything works in practice. Okay, so this is the game. We're gonna play so-called uh, board game. So you can see here we are on a gonna, we are all gonna start from uh, field zero, and this board has total of forty fields. Uh, just a sec. Oh, thanks all. Thanks for the assistance. So the board has forty fields. So your goal is to roll the dice using Jamie VRF and to collect happiness speed and wealth okay so whoever connect the most happiness points the most speed points and the most wealth points and it is here in the in the room can choose uh, from some of these of these prizes for the online participants you just have a glory that you won the game but suddenly no prize sorry you need to be uh, in 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 New York City or in the smart conference, maybe come next year. Okay, so how how game works? So first, uh, there is a smart contract uh, on a Gourley testnet. That's why you need a Gourley eat. Uh, I'll I'll sh give you the address and everything. I'll show. But first thing, you need to register your name. So we want to hide your wallet addresses. You're gonna register whatever string you want. Uh, if you don't register, you'll be on the board as a blank screen. So we want to avoid that, you know, so I can identify and give you the price. So basically, you can enter your name, your pseudonym, whatever, a joke. Don't be rude because I'm not filtering the content. But you need to register. Once you register, your name is going to pop up on the leaderboard. At the end, I'm going to just share the leaderboard. It's a static React uh, web page where you're going to see your name and your points and everything. From that point your interaction with the game is only through blockchain. So you can use either Remix or Etherscan. Personally, for me, Etherscan is easier because that's just a, a Explorer where I need to click register and then click the roll dice function. With Remix, you need to grab a copy of my code and paste it in Remix and load some address. I'll show you the both ways, but it's up to you how you're gonna play the game. So the first thing you need to register and after a successful registration, there is a second function called roll dice. And that's it. You need to click the roll dice. Roll dice requests random number from the VRF. And, you know, like a dice, it's going to uh, return numbers from one to six. So we learned in the previous uh, session with Patrick how you can get a, a random number within a range. So our range today will be from one to six because this is the dice. Again, you don't need to code everything. I code it. You just need to hit roll dice function. If you hit the roll dice function, this is the first transaction, right? Requesting from the Chainlink VRF. Until the second transaction as a callback from VRF doesn't include in the block, you cannot play. So there's like a require, which is going to prevent you from calling roll dice uh, like a maniac, okay? Cool. When you roll the dice, uh, let's say you get number four. So you're at 0, 0.00. 0. 
on the board. Number four is one, two, three, four. This is the, the green square, uh, the yellow, sorry, the yellow square on the, on the picture, for example. And each of these fields has some amount of happiness, speed, and wealth points. Okay, so let's say that I rolled a number four. This means that I'll uh, collect 10 happiness points and 10 speed points. You don't need to collect them. Just by stepping on the field, you're automatically gonna, gonna receive those points. And the, the UI are gonna uh, update manually. So how we coded the UI, you're gonna see it. It's a static web page, which is using React and Ethers.js. So Ethers.js listens for events from the blockchain. And whenever there is an event, specific event, is going to trigger the change on the UI. So this is really common pattern in blockchain development. So you don't want to have pooling mechanism where, for example, on 15 seconds, you're going to pull data from the blockchain. And no, you want to create event listeners. This is like a front-end stuff, okay? It's not like Solidity. But inside the React, using Ether.js, for example, uh, it's like a JavaScript library. So it's, it's not like React only. It, you can use it in whatever framework you work. You are going to listen for a specific event and then update the UI. Why? Because if you want to spam blockchain, your node or Alchemy or Infura or whatever RPC provider cannot handle that traffic, that amount of traffic. So you need to listen for a specific event. Okay, so this is the game mechanics. Uh, is everything clear about the game mechanics? All good there? Perfect. So register, roll dice, enjoy. After, uh, so we said like Borg has 40 uh, fields. After you and reach the end, that's it. So it's basically a pure luck whether you're going to win this ox or not. Sorry. Okay. So how we created this game? So first, we created this struct called profile. So in Solidity, as you learned this morning, structs are a complex uh, types, uh, which consist of primitive types. So primitive type in Solidity is unsigned integer, is address, is string, is boolean, and it's bytes. Okay, so those are primitive types built in into the language itself. Cool. So we can create these complex types called structs by combining these primitive types. So for example, we can create a struct called car and we can set unsigned integer like number of seats. We can have Boolean called locked is our call car locked or not or whatever. So we can create complex types. So this is this struct. So for the numbers, you can use unsigned integers. And when you type, uint when you type just uint in solidity it's uh default to uint 256 so you can see here that i'm using uint 32 32 and not uint 256 so why is that because i tend to optimize my solidity code okay so there was a really awesome lecture from alex Rohn, i think from the last uh, last Mercon, Smartcon, where he ta uh, ta uh, spoke about this memory optimization. So, optimizations. Exactly. Hitchhiker's Guide to the EVM. That's, you can Google it on YouTube. So, basically, the idea is uh, Solidity Storage consists of uh, 256 bits or 32 bytes slots. So you have one slot, which is 32 bytes, next slot, which is 32 bytes, etc. So this is 256 bits. Bits is like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay. When I uh, create a struct, and for example, I use this field position, and I know that my field position is, the maximum value is 40. So when you type uint 256, the range of those numbers is from 0 to uh, 2.256 minus 1, which is a huge number. I don't need that huge number because the maximum value for my game is 40. So I lower my type because I don't need this, this huge number. So I'm not going to work with them. Why is that? Because when I type uint, that variable going to fill the whole slot. Just that variable. When I type uint32 or uint16, then I'm going to use 16 or 32 bits, 
which is lower than 256, and my slot is going to be empty. So I'm pack my variable here, fill position, then happiness, then speed, then wealth, then boolean, which is smaller, and then string, which cannot be in the this slot, string is going to be in the next slot. Okay? So this is just a packing for memory optimizations. And it's a common pattern in Solidity. So I highly recommend, once again, to go to YouTube, search for last year's mark on Hitchhiker's Guide to the EVM. It's a 20 minute talk where you can uh, understand more why is this written, why, you know. Okay, so to map players, I used mapping. So mapping is a complex data struct in Solidity, which is similar to, for example, dictionary in C-sharp, if there is like C-sharp programmers over there, or hash tables in C++. So the idea is to create an so-called on-chain database where you have a key and a value. So key needs to be a primitive type. So key needs to be either unsigned integer, either integer, address, boolean, string, bytes. It can, key cannot be struct, for example. But values can be whatever you want. Array, another mapping, struct, obviously, etc., etc. So when you work with mappings, the most important thing is to use unique keys. So if, you, if your key is number, unsigned integer, if you have a mapping, let's say your key is five, number five, and you have some value, let's say string, five is John, and then during your coding, five is Ashley, for example, you're gonna override the content of John. So your keys needs to be unique. If you're using addresses, this is like a easy shot for you because all of the addresses are unique. So you don't need to worry about that. If you're using numbers, for example, make sure you have counter variable, which do not decrease, can just increase, okay? And if you're using, again, you're in 256, you have that whole range of numbers and you're pretty sure, pretty safe, sorry. So we mapped your address, your wallet addresses to this giant struct. And this giant struct, so you have this string name, this is gonna be populated when you call the register function. So we're gonna get, grab your wallet address and uh, in that key, the value for, you know, giant struct, the name for the field name in the giant struct is gonna be your string. Don't be rude again. And for the field position, happiness, speed, wealth, and this Boolean value, everything is gonna be handled by smart contract. So we are just reading those values from the UI. That's it. Okay. How we uh, coded the roll dice function, which you're gonna call multiple times and multiple times and multiple times. I deleted some of parts of this function uh, so it can uh, be <laughs> uh, shown on the screen. Uh, but uh, the important thing about this slide is to uh, learn that you always need to use check effects interaction pattern when you're writing Solidity. So again, check effects interaction pattern. What is that? Checks. You first need to validate all of the function inputs. If there's like a function inputs, you need to validate them. For example, if you have... Uh, transfer ownership function, you have admin multisig. You need to be absolutely sure that your new admin address is not address zero because you're gonna lose ownership of that contract, for example. This is an example. Or, you know, you don't need to have like, uh, for example, the, the new admin cannot be the address as the uh, previous admin, so you need to change, check that as well, et cetera, et cetera. So first you need to validate all of the inputs. So you can validate all of the inputs, this is checks, by using either require or if revert. So if you're using require, then you have condition and string, error string. So require says that the field position of this player needs to be less than 40 because the board has 39 field, you know, 40 field. So from zero to 39. Okay. And uh, if a field position is greater than 
that value. You, so you reach the end of the board. Uh, you're going to have this game over a message from your MetaMask or whatever wallet you're using. So require has a success condition and the error message. So we want this to be true. Otherwise, uh, revert with this message. If you're using custom errors or strings again, then you're using revert keyword. So you have require, revert, and assert. So with revert keyword, you're going to have an if bracket, if condition. And if a condition is true, then you're going to revert the error message. So the logic change changes now. So the logic will be if field position is greater or equal 40, then revert this custom error. Okay? So require and revert has different operator types. Okay? Uh, custom errors uh, were first introduced in Solidity 0.8.4, and they're more gas efficient than complex strings. So if you're working with require statements and you have these string messages, uh, make sure that those strings are less than 32 bytes because strings that are less than 32 bytes can fit in a single slot. And this code costs less gas, obviously. So those were checks. Then we have effects. Effects are basically when we are changing our state variables. So we have some effects on our uh, storage. So each smart contract can have its own storage, okay? So effect can be increase counter to one for the mapping or whatever. And we have interactions. So interactions are interactions between our own functions and or external functions. So I can have a getter function, which is from my smart contract. And that getter function can get me the, the value for this mapping, for example, which I'm going, you know, I pass the key, get me the value, or can be interaction with outside contract like Chainlink VRF. So when I'm requesting random numbers here, I'm calling VRF coordinator. This request random words is not a function from my smart contract, my smart contract. It's from the VRF coordinator smart contract. So I'm I, uh, interacting with another smart contract. Okay. And finally, I need to emit event. That's it. So checks, require, reverse, whatever. Effects, do whatever your logic is. Interactions, if there's any interaction, call another smart contract, whatever. And then you, you not must, but it's, Let's say must, you must emit event. Because if you want to later index your smart contract, or you want to create a script, Python script, or UI, or whatever, all of those uh, types of uh, software products are going to listen for events. And events are cheaper than reading from a storage. Okay? So imagine that you're like a database uh, admin for some Linux clusters you need to take care of logs. So your class is going to log something, log, 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 log. This is the event on Solidity on blockchain. So these events are basically logs. So you want to, there's a hack or some problem, whatever, you're going to roll back and check all of the logs, all of the events to see what happened. Okay. So this was the roll dice function, check effects interactions. Okay. Now the second function is, sorry, fulfill random words. So this is the function that we, uh, that we uh, implemented from the interface. So you learned previously that you, when, you want to, uh, when you want to work with Chainlink VRF, you need to implement that interface. So this is what this override keyboard, uh, keyword is all about. You need to override this. You, you need to basically implement the functionality the, the, which is written inside the interface, and that interface has one fulfill random function, like a signature for the function, and you need to implement it in your smart contract. The, uh, the internal keyword is um, something that uh, is going to limit who can call the smart contract. Who can call, sorry, who can call this function? So with the roll dice, the visibility modifier is external, but for Fulfill random words, the visibility modifier is internal. So, external, uh, so sorry, public, everyone can call. 
if your function is public, everyone can call it. External, if your function is external, everyone can call it besides the smart contract itself. So your smart contract cannot call its own function if that function has external modifier. Uh, is, yeah, external modifier. You, you need to make it public so your, your smart contract can call it as well. Internal, only your smart contract and the smart contracts that implements it can call it. So this is, uh, you know, if you're using VRF interface, you know, you can, uh, VRF corner can use it and, and your, because we are currently implemented that interface. And private, private means that only your smart contract can call that function. The same applies to variables. Variables can also be public, external, internal, private. The general misconception when it comes to the private keyword is that you think, not you, but people think that if I mark my variable, for example, string, which is keyword as a private, that means that only my contract can see it. That's not true. On blockchain, all information are public. Private means that only my smart contract can access that string, for example, that variable. But if I go to Etherscan, I can see it and you can see it and everyone can see it. So private is not like encoding the coding stuff. Private is, is the scope of who can call the function. Okay. Uh, inside this fulfill random words function, we have this dice value, which is basically we grab the random word from the chain link VRF and we are using it in a range. So our range is one to six. That's why we have this modulo assigned, like a percentage. This is modulo on, on solidity. We have some uh, grabbing from mapping. We have uh, this get reward is a public function, which is a function of mine smart contract, which gets me rewards. So this is basically checked for on that field, uh, you know, how many wealth, happiness, whatever uh, points are there and just assigned to my struct. And then once again, I emit event, an event. So I'm listening on my uh, UI for the moved event. And whenever there's a moved event, I have this message.sender and I'm gonna ab update only your row. I'm not gonna refresh the whole UI. I'm update updating only the piece, the component that changed. Okay, so I want to save uh, space, memory, whatever. Okay, do we have any questions about this? This is just a recap from, from the morning lectures. Yes. Yeah. My question is earlier when you were talking about the map, it sounds like it's a 40 square. Each piece of the square has a pre-identified value. It doesn't have to be the speed of what, is that right? Yeah, okay. so it's predefined and this get reward function just gets those predefined values. Okay. It's not actually an array table, it's a giant switch case because it's cheaper. So I have if field position is one, return, if two, return, if three, return. It's an extremely ugly code, extremely ugly, but it's cheaper. So you can see always on Solidity an extremely ugly code basis, but before, because they are cheaper. So for example, those unchecked blocks, maybe you heard about them or you're gonna learn about it. So unchecked means that if you have number, don't check for underflows, overflows. May, for, for example, for my use case, I know that I have only 40 fields on the board, one through 40. So I can use unchecked blocks because I am 100% sure that is not gonna overflow underflow. And that code, is an extremely ugly, those unchecked fields, blocks, whatever, but it's cheaper. So that's why our get reward is extremely ugly if, you know, this giant if switch case from whatever, because it's cheaper than to read from the mapping, from the array, whatever, because mappings, array, all of those stuff are written in storage and reading and writing to storage is the most expensive operation on blockchain. 
that's why you know it's written that way. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. 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 I just deleted it because to to uh, fill the the slide. So you can see later my whole uh, function. It's a bit more uh, have more sli uh, lines just to to make the point. So roll dice essentially has this require statement and again is your turn. So two require statements. Uh, in some cases, custom errors are cheaper. So either you're gonna use require with strings that are 30 bytes, 32 bytes long or custom error, okay? So if you're using short strings, you're gonna use require. Your condition is gonna be true. For custom errors, you know, the logic will be opposite. Okay, cool. Because if, uh, you know, uh, field position is greater and then equal 40, then you're gonna enter the if statement and revert the custom error. Okay, so this will check uh, request random version in these interactions. This applying to, to mapping was effect and we emitted event eventually. Okay, any other questions? Cool, okay, let's play the game, shall we? Cool. Okay, uh, you have your own laptops. Go to GitHub and search for this repo, vrf-board-game, or if you're a maniac, you can type this address inside the Gore later scan and grab the, and grab the, the smart contract address. Because at the, in this repo, the, the contract is linked in the readme, so you can just click and go to the later scan. Okay, so once again, search for online participants, search for VRF dashboard dash game and go to the readme file. Okay, I'm now gonna, yeah, so I'll just taking pictures one more second. Okay, I am inside the, the GitHub repo. I can zoom it a bit, what do you say? Yes, okay, so this is the, Source code for this game, it's written in Foundry. So if I go here to Gorli Testnet, if I click here, this linked uh, URL is gonna lead me to uh, this uh, page. So this is the my, my smart contract on Gorli Etherscan. If you go here, you can see the source code for this smart contract. What we want to do is to go to Write Contract tab so write contract tab, connect your wallet, connect to Web3, make sure you have any kind of wallet extension installed. You see, MetaMask, Wallet Connect, Coinbase Wallet, whatever. I'm gonna connect my wallet to Etherscan. And now I can interact with my smart contract using Etherscan. So the first thing is to call the register function. Please call the register function, enter some string, and don't be rude, okay? So I'm gonna enter my name, which is Andre. Gonna hit write. Gonna sign the transaction. You see here, I just need to sign the transaction. And that's it. I need to wait this transaction to be included. So wait for a MetaMask pop-up confirmation. Okay, you need to wait for that. If you don't have Gorli it one more time, go to faucets.chain.link, connect your wallet, grab, grab some free Gorli ETH because you need, need those for paying the gas, okay? So after successful registration, I just need to call roll dice function. And the roll dice function, we're gonna roll dice for me, is gonna put me in some place on the board, is gonna grab points from that field, and after you know uh, my uh, interaction with the smart contract ends, I have new points, then I can call roll dice again. If you spam the game, it's gonna revert. Okay, so you need to wait. First transaction, call to the VRF. Second transaction, wait for the callback. On the UI, you have the column field is your turn, set to yes or no. If it's yes, it's free, Is it's, it's Safe for you to call the roll dice. 
If it's not, it's going to revert, so don't waste your time. OK. If I want to use Remix, then I need to open remix.ethereum.org website. I need to create a new smart Solidity file. I already created. I'm going to increase. Yeah, sorry, zoom it. Sorry. Yep. I need to go to my repo, go to the source folder. OK, wait for the internet connection. OK, boardgame.sol. This is the source code for this game. OK, this is the, the ugly get reward function that I'm talking about. Look at this. Ah. Absolutely nightmare, but it's cheaper. And on Solidity, on blockchain, everything is about making your user's life easier by not spending their money. Okay. So what I need to do is to click here to copy this entire source code to clipboard, go to re Remix, paste it here. Okay. I paste it one more time, compile it by clicking either command.rs or click this compiled board game. And then you need to go to this deploy and run transactions tab, deploy and run transactions, and make sure you're not on Remix VM, but you're, uh, you're chosen this injected provider dot, uh, dash MetaMask. So, because you need to be on a Gourley testnet, okay? We are not deploying our smart contract now. We are interacting with a smart contract which is already deployed on the blockchain. So we need the source code of that smart contract, its address, and chain ID. Chain ID is number five for Gorley. Okay. So we are not going to hit deploy orange button. We are going to hit at address blue button. So if I go to Etherscan, I can click here, copy the address of my already deployed game uh, smart contract, put it here. And when I click this at address button, the new instance, I'm going to close this one. You see the second instance pop up. And now I can interact with already deployed smart contract using Remix. So again, I have register function. I have roll dice function. So whatever method is easier to use for you, use that method. For me personally, it's easier to interact using Etherscan because I don't have all of these extra steps to make it work in Remix. But maybe you're more familiar with the Remix when you have all of this uh, green, blue, uh, red, if it's payable function, red buttons and everything. So you, you're absolutely sure what you are doing. Okay. And that's it. We are built now for the, look at this leaderboard. This is all of your names, okay? So the, you, I am gonna zoom it a bit. So we have, yep. Address is, if you go to vrf.board, uh, dash board, dash game, in the readme file, there's a link to the Etherscan webpage and you can go, okay. So we have a uh, surgeon, Anon, uh, five star, sad, one, Alex, whatever. So we have happiness, speed, wealth, which is all sortable fields. So if I click here, speed, you know, some guy called five star has the most speed at the moment. Wealth again, you know, and we have this field position. So if your field position is greater than 40, leave it. You, you reach the end of the board. You cannot play anymore. That's it. So the, the, Tricky part with this game is that the, the luckiest person win, wins. Sorry. So the luckiest guy is going to win this sucks because it's just uh, a simple game to uh, demonstrate all of the things that you learned to build today. And finally, is your turn in progress? Yes, no. If it's yes, wait. If it's no, go ahead, click roll dice function again. That's pretty much it. I'm going to zoom this a bit. There's a bunch of you playing right now. And uh, until when so we have time to play this game? It's 4.08 now. Until 4.30 or until 5. Let's see. 4.45. So in, on 4.45, we're going to announce winners. 
So once again, for the online participants, sorry, prizes only for the in-person participants, but you know, you have uh, a proof on blockchain that you won this fabulous game. Uh, and if you won these prizes, make sure to come to next year's marathon in person to hang out with us. I know for some of you, New York is maybe far, you know, for European people, maybe from Australia and whatever. But after that long flight, you'll be able to, to walk around this beautiful city. So uh, it works to come to this Marcon. Okay, so the trick with this UI is that it uh, updates automatically. So the UI is, is listen for the events. So that is why it is it important to emit events from your smart contract. You have logs, you can index your smart contract, you can uh, create powerful, more powerful UI, and generally your users uh, will, will uh, have a better understanding about what is currently happening uh, on the blockchain. Because if you wanna query the storage variable, you can only query the last written value. You cannot go in history, right? But with events, you can compare, compare whatever, what's happened prior. Okay, so, well, okay. The, uh, okay, let's sort this by field position. Okay, so five star is on field 21. So he or she or it, whatever, uh, completed the, the half of the board. Surgeon is at field position 15. Then we have a bunch of people at field 11. So this is the reason why we haven't coded the, the actual board. Because imagine that you're all at the field zero or field one and bunch of you like just sitting on top of each other's heads. So that, that's, that's currently the situation with the field position number 11. Uh, but yeah, so this is, you know, like, uh, it's kind of like analytics web page where you can see the, the, the current state of, this, of the game smart contract. So this is it. So this is the leaderboard that uh, re updates automatically. We are going to check it again one more time. For the online participants, if you missed what... Yeah. For online guys, if you missed what we are doing now, we are playing the VRF board game in person at SmartCon 2022 at Developers Day. You know, you can hear now. Sorry? The whole? Yeah, the board position. So give me a sec. There is a column value. Okay. Uh, just to refresh, there's a column value your position so we saw for five star was 15 for a bunch of people was 11. sorry this field position do you see this field position so your field position try to find your name you have you see your name name Yes, there's a getter function, get uh, profile details or something like that. It's going to get the whole row for you. So you can manually query if you want it. Uh, if you want to, to see, uh, you go to read contract tab. It's not right, read. And then there's like a getter function, okay? Read contract, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent question. So, if you want to see where you are using smart contract, you need to go to read contract tab. So we are just reading stuff from the blockchain. This is free. 
and call get score function. So get score. You need to enter your wallet address there and get score is gonna ping that player's mapping. So you're passing your wallet address to this get function. It's gonna grab the value from the mapping which has that key. So your wallet address is a key. And from that position, this is O of one. It's like the, the, the most efficient way to get something from the blockchain. It's gonna grab the, all of these, the whole structure and all of these properties, where you are, happiness, speed, wealth, is your position, etc., etc., etc. Any questions, maybe? Are we having fun? Yes. Uh, it should increase, you know, plus equal. Let's see. We have bug. Yeah. Good catch. Do we want to fix it now? Live coding and redeploy the smart contract. No. You're at the lead position. I can feel that. Yeah. Do we have time to redeploy it? Let's do it. Okay, live coding. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, so we need to increase this. Plus, plus. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to redeploy the smart contract. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys, one more time. Okay. I'm going to quickly stop sharing my screen so you don't see my private key. Yeah, sorry. This? Oh, I'm online. <laughs> I need to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you, Sal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it happens. That's in production. <laughs> okay, give me a second. Press your uh, browser. Okay, uh, 20 seconds and we're good to go. Question for you. Not <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm joking. I haven't created for this project, and that's why I stopped sharing my screen. It's a bad practice, it's a bad practice, but I'm on the test net, so that's the reason why. When you want to go live, you need. Uh, the best solution is to use burner wallets. You just create a wallet, deploy smart contract, and live it. For the security perspective, that's the best what you can do. But it's always what you're doing about what you're doing and rather than what you're saying. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you. No worries. <laughs> Okay, okay. Just give me a sec to be as quick as possible. Yeah. You're making me nervous now. <laughs> but yeah, good catch. Thanks. You deserve the, the socks. Okay, give, give this man a sock. Okay, he won the game. <laughs> I imagine those people who are on the live stream now, you know, 
instead in, in front of their computers and like, wow, what's this guy is doing? Like, fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Who hired you, man? Sorry. It's I know. Everyone is waiting for the new. Are you sure? It froze. <laughs> okay, very good. Bye. It it froze for fifteen seconds. Sorry. This is normal. This is life. Yeah, this is this is life in crypto. Like this is normal. Test in production. Yeah, go for it. Okay. It's a great feeling. I I love it. I enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Running the script. Game board, game board, game board, game. Okay. Double check, double check everything. Maybe it was a wise move to play it in a hotel yesterday. But yeah. <laughs> okay. So I run the deployment script one more time the thing that i need to do is to finally again add this contract as a vrf consumer so if you're creating a vrf smart contract and you want to request runs and it's failed double check have you add this contract as a consumer and have enough link tokens yes yeah no <laughs> Don't tell me that, bro. We cannot redeploy it 100 times, you know. I'll send this code to, uh, you know, for audit to this guy. And when, once he audited, then we can play it tomorrow, maybe. Yeah. It's not my fault, yeah. I did my fault. It's not big, but it's honest work. So. Okay, so yeah, game mechanics are pretty simple. I hope, yeah. Uh, the pad, do you think it's gonna freeze my computer again because of the internet connection, no? No window, we'll see. It's still deploying, so yeah. It's not. It's not. Yeah. Verifying on ether scan. Okay. Uh, are you curious why this took so long? No. When you're deploying your smart contract, especially after the merge, okay, the merge happened. You need to wait for some block confirmations until you're sure that your smart contract is on the right fork. So it's possible to have some chain reorganizations because of double spending problem. What after the merge, after the merge, when you want to deploy your contract, you need to wait for at least two uh, finalized slots. So after two finalized slots, yeah, so it takes some time, you know. Um, so uh, after two finalized epochs, sorry. So one epoch, two epoch, you can get from Hardhead Foundry, whatever, it, it, you know, was it finalized? After two finalized epochs, 
then you're safe to continue with the uh, interactions of your smartphone. So that, you know, includes verifying on ether scan, set admin functionalities, all of that stuff. Because if you're on a wrong, wrong fork, fork because of the chain reorganizations and everything, that's not good. So that's why we are waiting so, so on. Uh, on testnet, no. But on testnet, you're practicing good practices for the mainnet. Because on testnet, you're going to create a deployment script and you're going to use it on testnet and you can see that it doesn't work like we are seeing now. And then you're going to redeploy it and redeploy it and everything. And if you're not uh, behaving like you, you will behave on the mainnet, that's where bugs happen. Okay. So you need to be very careful. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, so we'll share the address. One more thing I need to add it as a BRF consumer. And you can see now how I, I'm going to add it. That's okay for you to see. If you come on Friday to Hacker House, we'll have a game that works. Okay. So please do come. It's awesome. I tested. I tested it. Yeah. Uh, I'm. I don't know. Council knows my address. I, I never shared with you guys. Okay, so probably uh, go to EtherScan and see all of the transactions from my wallet. My wallet is an admin wallet for the previous uh, previous iteration of smart contract, so you can grab it from here. But I'm, I'm gonna share it with you. Like block explorers are so powerful if you know how to use them. Just a personal thought. Okay, uh, you see this? Yeah. So I'm gonna, one more time. Yeah, after I add. Yeah. Eventually we'll give the socks to the last dev standing in the room. <laughs> Sorry guys. But I hope it's, it's fun watching me sweating on the stage. Yeah, probably. Okay. So, this is my subscription, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, if you're using the exactly the same source code for my game and you deploy it by your own, you're going to be the only one playing it. We're... Okay. Okay. Uh, no, the source code changed. We add that plus. <laughs> Maybe I'm not understanding the question. Sorry, I'm multitasking. Yeah, the UI is the same. And once again, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen to change the address inside my UI because my UI is using my alchemy key. So please don't spam it. That's why I'm not sharing the screen because we cannot use the UI if we uh, spam that key. Yeah, it's in my .env file, but still I can see it from my studio code. So yeah, good practice is to put inside the env file. Once you deploy it, live then no worries but this is essentially the reason why i haven't deployed over cell or something because i can quickly change stuff if something broke for the game i mentioned for friday it's already deployed it's live finger crossed it's awesome called zk puzzles have anyone does anyone know here anything about zero knowledge zk stuff yeah Friday Hacker House. Oh, ZK rollups, yes, but ZK as knowledge, you know, ZK is a separate technology which can be used for whatever you want. We're going to talk about that technology and play game that has 
more prettier UI than this one. So that's, you know, please come. Okay, so I'm waiting for Manza to be included in the block, not mind anymore. We had the merge. And then, uh, okay, you can start playing right now. Uh, so have you give them the address? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you can go to SourcePad, grab the address, start playing, and I'm gonna spin up the UI one more time to save, you know, save time. Three socks left. I mean, I'm gonna buy new socks for everyone. You're patient with me. And also, we have something special here. Okay, so you can choose socks or this. It's like a Schrodinger's cat now. Or that's a bad metaphor. I'm not sure. Oh, anyway. uh, I don't know. Native speakers. Oh, yeah. It's called Stink. <laughs> so, uh, board game. It should have the same ABI. Yep. No, one more second. Because we're on the same Wi Fi network and that it was making it slowish. But we're going to get that. Are you guys going to join the training hackathon? Yeah. Hackathon, yeah. Did you participate in the previous hackathons? Yeah. Last year. Perfect. See ya. Okay. Let's see what's going on here. Oh, maybe you're not, you know, waiting for a your turn, whatever. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, no, you rolled the dice. So both, yeah, so you roll the dice and you're waiting for a random number. You're waiting for your dice to, to stop. And then I can roll mine. But we can roll three of us at the same time. Uh, there is no picking. You have your, your own dice, let's say. You're playing. And you're just running it. Sorry. Uh, you're waiting for a callback from VRF. Yeah, 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 yeah. In a, you know, one to six. Yeah. Patrick taught you how to build the dice. I'm just now using it. Apparently wrong. Because game goes okay. Yeah, dice worked. Yeah, dice worked. My logic for the game did. Yeah. Thank you, Sol. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was that was it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we are gonna check it because first you can see here this. Wait a second. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. We have a new leaderboard and there are some names popping out. So we are gonna see why is your failing that. It. Just unresponsive, responsive. Wait. Uh, have you shared my screen to the StreamYard? Not yet. Okay, you can. Okay, I'm going to see uh, what's going on with their calls. Uh, the UI shared. Thanks for participation and thanks for your patience. Be right back. Yeah. Does it matter? No. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, because there is an error, probably. So it's gonna fail. This. No. 
you know, okay, so cancel all of these transactions, reject all of them, and then try one, one, more, one more time. So just roll the ass. Let's see. You have a pending transaction. Cancel it. Uh, open MetaMask. Uh, reject that one. Just reject that one. Open MetaMask again. Uh, activity. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Find the uh, the the pending one and cancel it. You you have the cancel button here. Refresh, refresh. Or refresh everything. Try that pending transaction to cancel if it's possible, and then roll it out because the the pending transaction is in the mempool, and we need you know that's why. Another transaction can't go through until that one's out. It's gonna fail. Uh, can you? I don't know. This is. It's reactive. Okay. <laughs> I respect that. I need to go. I said, "Don't be rude, guys." What is this about? I don't have a mechanism to ban any of you, but I have a mechanism to maybe sort by well. Oh man, it's gonna pop out anyway. Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Thanks for playing one more time. Uh, we have 10 more minutes, but if you want, we can stick around for another 15 if you want to finish the game, or it's good, okay, so cool. Mm. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. So a bunch of us are waiting for a callback from VRF. Okay, cool. So we are waiting here <laughs> to see if someone has more, ten, more than 10 points in any category. This means that we were successfully deployed our game contract. That was right. Cool. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to spin up our own blockchain. That's probably us and the people from the stream, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Gorli testnet is crying because of us, guys. But, yeah. It is what it is. How many of these do we have? Five. Maybe we can give multiples. Multiple. Two. I don't need because five, five, that's 25. There's no 25 people. Cool. Okay, so playing you can first. Uh, tomorrow the smart con starts, so make sure if you have tickets to go to the venue. There will be an awesome talk, and also some hopefully awesome side activities created by us. Those work, I promise. We tested those. Um, so yeah, you should be able to participate in multiple uh, fun events. And also on Friday, there's a Hacker House. Again, games, talks, uh, scavenger hunt, uh, advanced topics and solidity, EVM, training, whatever. So make sure to come. Uh, registrations are still open. Uh, do you want maybe to see that slide one more time for Hacker House or we are gonna stick with the leaderboard? Okay. See you on Friday then. Cool. Unfortunately, yes. 
I mean, it's not unfortunate. I can go out, but if you cannot make it, then it's not unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. cool. Oh, uh, we're waiting for a callback from Vera. It should, but maybe we killed it like we did with Gorley. Who knows? It's 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 everything is it's on testnet. <laughs> there 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 are prizes, guys. There are prizes. We have something. Five more minutes. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Okay, who's Austin? Cool. Who's Kason? Kason? Oh, that's me. That's you. Who is the third one on the list? No one wants to tell. Okay, no prize for the third one. <laughs> okay, Chris, I, that's you. Okay, Oliver, perfect. A oh, loser. <laughs> who's loser, guys? Who's loser? Okay, I see you. Okay, okay. So that's five. I'm counting us because of the prizes, okay? Uh, Dorian. Yeah, my name. Michael. Hi, Michael. Jay Albert. Yeah. You're coming on Friday? Oh, man, that sucks. Sparkling like water. Yeah. Yeah. Robert won. Hi, man. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Shlomi and Travis. Oh, you're two playing together. That's dope. Like that. Sandeep. Yeah. Saul. Saul. <laughs> Saul is not eligible for a prize. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Alex. Yep. Uh, you babe. Yeah. Eric. Nick and Village Farmer. Yeah. Oh, let's refresh the UI. Um, Let's see. I funded my subscription. So, uh, total spent 47. Yeah, we have more balance, so it's not balance. We have 175 fulfillments. Uh, September, so this is our, let's see. Oh, no, sorry. That that leads to Peter's scan. We don't want that. Yeah, we don't want that. By Eric. So, yeah. Uh, actions. See, so, yeah, man. Oh, we don't want that. <laughs> I, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe something is stuck. Uh, we can. I yeah yeah my computer froze. Okay, pending pending. Yeah, we have a bunch of pending transactions. Not bunch, just three, only three transactions. So the rest of one was were success. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. Only three are pending right now, which is expected. 
No. Uh, because it needs to be called by VRF coordinate. You want another pair of socks? What's about that about? <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Let's let's quickly check what it is. Live debugging on stage. Fulfill random rules. Yeah, you can call it. Oh no, this is raw raw fulfill random rules. So the reason why it's here because I've never implemented that function. So inside the raw fulfill random front word, it's empty code block. So we cannot do anything. You can call it manually, but it's not gonna, yeah. That's cool. That was a nice catch actually, congrats. But yeah, so the fulfill random front words without the raw prefix is where the previously bad logic and now hopefully good logic is with plus equals and everything else. Okay. Okay, I refreshed. Oh, we're we're on time. Okay, we have a couple of pending transactions, which is kind of unfair to the person who called it. Uh, let's see, let's see how we can do it. Okay, we can award the person from the previous raffle who reached the the most on on the board. Is this fair to you? Okay, let's. Uh, check the events log. How we do that? So if I go to events, it's easier just to you know. We can do the the we can do the easier way actually. I'll just switch the previous address. So stop sharing my screen now. They're gonna steal my free alchemy key. Okay, it froze in again. Tick tock, tick tock. Do we have twenty two? This because there are twenty two people, so we can give this. Okay. Everyone is winner, and we will see about the sex. Who can't live without chain link sock? <laughs> we cannot decide with it. Sorry, I tried. Do we want that for two pairs? For the one pair, we can do the board stuff, okay? Maybe, okay. Who slaps me the hardest can win, right? Because I, I imagine like you're all pissed. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Couple of seconds. A for Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. This is the previous one. Come on, don't, don't, don't. Uh, yeah, but I think it's faster if you just spin up the UI than to manually compare the events, if you agree. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Oh, let's see what's going on. Oh, who is Surgeon from the previous raffle? 
He got some. He left. He was at the field. He, he reached the end of the board, like the, the one other guy. So, but we gave it socks to other, to other guys. Okay, let's. You can see a bunch of memes, screenshots while this is expanding. I am a meme fan. Yeah, just wait for a couple more seconds. I'm live. Okay. We're trying to decide to whom we are going to give socks because we have these for everyone. So These are nice. I, I don't have this. Okay. So, field position. Let's sort this by highest number. H-O-A-O -O from the previous raffle. Come here to the stage. Brett, you deserve it. Should we like take a picture? <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> okay, Jay Albert. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Hardly deserved. Yeah. Thanks. And Eric. Okay. For the rest of one, everyone can grab one piece of this. Don't steal two or whatever. We don't have it. I don't have this. So please talk to someone. Give me this awesome piece of swag. Congrats, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have an official photographer, but this was nice. Okay. I hope you enjoyed. I'm sorry once again that. The initial version didn't work, but it was fun watching me sweating here. So yeah, we learned something about redeploying and everything. So once again, when you want to deploy a smart contract, especially after the merge, wait for at least two finalized epochs. One is not enough, two. That told me, that info told me one guy from the Ethereum Foundation. So I assume they know their, their stuff. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I hope you had fun. Even if you didn't play the game, uh, we talked about check effect interaction pattern, about some VRF stuff, about some good and bad practices and solidity. So I hope uh, this was useful for you and for you guys. We can, you know, stay chill, chat about it. Chat, sorry. I'm not a native speaker. So yeah. But yeah, that was it. Thank you. Don't forget this one. Ziki puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> That's also not gonna work. So am I stream still in the stream? <laughs> Bye.